started, and as people trickle in, they, they trickle in. Uh, we're here today to speak with uh, transportation, technology, manufacturing, and um, construction industry um, speakers to hear what they have to say about artificial intelligence. Um, there's some new faces joining the group, um, so maybe we go around the room real quickly and introduce ourselves. I'm Brian Breslin. I'm a civil engineer uh, working in really transportation-related um, engineering um, with a private consultant firm called Du Bois & King. Uh, I'm Guy Ruel. I'm uh, with Du Bois & King as well. I'm the, I worked with uh, uh, Mr. Sigali for quite a few years at the Agency of Transportation as the Aeronautics Administrator. I'm Donna Rizzo, Professor of Civil and Environmental Engineering at the University of Vermont. I work with AI and all sorts of applications, and I'm part of this task force. I'm you here, Igor Osowski. Um, I'm the, the CTO of Vera Semi, that's a spin off that came out of Global Foundries, and my focus is AI. I'm Nick Grimley, I'm the Director of Entrepreneurship and Technology Commercialization for the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. I'm part of Michael Schroeder. My name is Milo Kress. I'm a high school senior and artificial intelligence enthusiast. Jill Charbonneau, I am president of the Vermont State Labor Council, AFL-CIO. Joe Sigali, Vermont DC of Transportation, Policy Planning, and Research. Uh, I'm John DeLay, I'm a member of the TAS, what are they, TAS? Task Force. Task Force. Yeah. <laughs> um, I'm a retired justice of the Supreme Court. Go cool for it. Matt Swenson, Paul Media. Steve Law, CEO at RSG. Oh, I'm Kayla, I'm a staff member. Do we have a quorum? Yeah, I don't think we have seven, so. One, two, three, three, three four, five, six. <coughs> right? yeah, John so, so, told so me he is, was WebExing in, and I thought. Yeah, I so can, let me turn. I have a feeling. Cooking the web so, so we, yeah, I, I, I need to listen, obviously, for this Can we, we so this is the first time this happened. Um, so can we make, what are the rules associated with, can we make decisions? Uh, like acceptance of, acceptance of meetings? I think not, that would more. Okay. Well, we can um, go on well, to. We may have one here. We might have John, you said. What's that? Did John you say John was planning to join? He's definitely us? WebEx again. Okay. And I, Looks like he's there. Hey, John, are you there? Hey, John, are you there? Hmm. I heard him faintly. <laughs> <laughs> no? He's trying to write it all the way. Oh, there's something else. Oh, there's. He's there. He's there. He's there. It's yeah. No, it's, there's an echo, but there's also another noise. Yeah. I think there might be, I don't know if you dialed in with both the phone and the computer. Um, yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, that's why we're here. Yeah. I'm going to shut this off. I have not got the Skype for business training yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, is he calling in or is he doing something he different? Should, he should be. He said he was calling in. He's using WebEx. What, what's, oh. Do you feel yeah, like yeah, he's yeah. there? Yeah, he uses WebEx. He said he's there. Yeah, yeah. 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 yeah, that's what I thought. I guess until he shows up and we get a quorum, I think we'll move on to, uh, we'll leave the acceptance of minutes until someone else shows up or we save until the next meeting. So. I am totally technologically inept, but if he's joining us via a computer, is that what's happening? So how, if we don't have a computer on for him to join it's us, how would he join us? He'll come, to the He'll come on yeah. the phone. Yeah. Thank you. If he's there, I'm not sending an email. I guess we'll save the acceptance of minutes again until someone else shows up or uh, next meeting. Uh, Next agenda on the item would be um, public comment period, if there is any. Um, would anybody like to comment about <coughs> for this for this task force? Hearing none, uh, I guess going on to the 
next item on the list would be which would be an overview of AI by Milo. So, good morning. Um, as you know, my name is Milo Kress. Uh, my computer isn't working. I had a visual presentation planned out, but that's fine. We have a whiteboard here, so. Um, I guess the, the first question um, that our committee has considered, um, and the first question that really came to my mind when I was learning about artificial intelligence is how do you define it? Um, and the definition that I was working with as I created this presentation was um, some computer system uh, which displays traits that we would traditionally consider human, such as the ability to change its internal state to optimize itself to perform a certain task. Um, so, my understanding of AI is that uh, it largely arose from statistical modeling where you create um, you know, some kind of model where um, the, the, the model is basically a function and the output of that function for a given input is some meaningful number or piece of data. Something that can um, predict a feature of a data set without actually um, knowing what the exact value for that feature is. For example, uh, if, if you're modeling, uh, <laughs> we're having technical difficulties on any levels today. <laughs> yeah. um, if you're trying to you know, find a model for, for these data points, you could use linear regression, as I've learned about in statistics class, to just draw a line here. And if we, if we have some kind of test point you know, to, to see if our model is correct, Sorry, Milo. <laughs> no <worries. laughs> you know, if it's um, it's right here, we can say that our model has predicted the earlier point there, um, and so that's a good model. But the thing is, as as the volume of data that we have increases, as the amount of variation and noise in that data increases, and as uh, as the the complexity of the rules that create that data increase. Um, it, it becomes less and less possible to use traditional modeling systems where some programmer or statistician chooses, uh, chooses the model itself. We have to create models which are able to build themselves or at least create some initial model and some function for updating the model over time. Hey, Brian. How are we not? So, that's where artificial intelligence comes in as, as we know it today. If you have, um, if most models are, are thought of, um, or, or many AI models are, are thought of as, as neural networks, um, where you have neurons, basically, and they're connected to each other, you know, in a network structure. So if these, if you have, uh, say you're trying to calculate the value of a house, um, given a few parameters, Say you know the number of windows in the house, and you know the square footage of the house, and you're given those two things, and you connect them to your neural network. You connect them to each neuron. Now, a simple model of this might be to just give a certain amount of weight to each input feature. Like if, if a, a house has one more window, then we can say it costs $10,000 more. That's a pretty simple model, and it might not work out very well. You'd have to test it against some kind of data set. But um, when you're using a neural network, you randomly assign weights. And you connect this network as, as fully as you can. Um, you know, the, the exact connection features of the network vary depending on what you're trying to get. But the idea is that eventually, this will boil down into a, a, a single value. You know, and, and that value is uh, some kind of prediction for the value of a house. And once you get that value, you can see if it matches your data set. You, um, you generally start with a, a training data set, which is labeled. You know, if you, um, you have a house with, with three windows and 1,500 square feet, and you know that that house is worth $250,000, then you can, um, you can add that to your training data set. And then, when this model is run through completely, you know, and it, it produces some kind of estimate, say $150,000.
you can then compare that to the actual value and then get some kind of idea for how you're going to update each neuron in the network using pretty complex calculus and uh, the, the back propagation algorithm, which was developed fairly recently in is that the learning part? Yeah, this That's is sort of the. Yeah, and a lot of times um, with AI systems, you know, the, the two algorithms are often thought of as, as being the same. You know, a model which is able to predict and learn, because those are some of the key features of neural networks. But those are two distinct abilities. Um, when a neural network runs in the forward direction, that's just a prediction. But the power of it comes when that prediction is coupled with an algorithm that's able to update the model to be a little bit more accurate each time. And the ability to do that is what makes these algorithms able to consume billions of, of pieces of data and spit out a model which is highly tuned to a specific data set or to you know, a, a generalized form of data. Um, Anyway, uh, I, this, this was a, a pretty fascinating thing for me to figure out because the, the ability for pretty simple models to, to, to model pretty complex data was surprising to me, but it makes sense. When we think about the, um, the laws of nature which we have described, which model how, um, how particles behave and how, um, you know, how elements of a population behave, those, those models are generally fairly simple. You know, E equals MC squared, F equals MA. All of those models are easily expressed within a single line. But the thing is, those were discovered by people. What we're doing is giving algorithms the ability to discover those models for themselves. And in doing so, create valuable prediction algorithms for future behaviors of systems. Um, so that's... Uh, that's my understanding of how AI works um, at, at a basic level. But this is generally to solve the problem of classification. Given certain inputs, what's the output? You know, given certain known variables, how can we use that to calculate an unknown variable? And that doesn't translate to some of the problems that we're seeing AI um, applied to right now. So the question is, how do you transform some kind of problem of classification to a problem of some kind of actor state model where you're driving a driverless car and, and you're trying to optimize your reward signal and minimize your punishment signal if you if you have one of those. And what you see is that you can you can apply the same the same basic algorithm um, in that domain. You can have say uh, you know some uh, some actor maybe you know I'm not trying to well. Maybe you have Pac-Man. You know, he's <laughs> moving around trying to eat the dots. And each time Pac-Man eats a little dot, it, it gets a reward signal. Um, and the the goal of, uh, of of this algorithm would be, given a certain action, which would be encoded here, what would the predicted reward be? And it's trained over time as it makes those actions to to figure out what the reward over time is of a given action. And then using that, going backwards through the algorithm and trying to find the optimal action to maximize the reward. This, the neural networks are, are really powerful because they don't just run in one direction, they don't just predict a value, they update their internal state. And also they can give you meaningful outputs based on a given input, and also meaningful inputs based on a given output. Um, so that's, um, that's basically how um, my understanding of, of neural networks is under the hood, and how I see AI being applied in, you know, in, in domains such as classification and also uh, reward optimization. There are many other domains. Yeah. Would you say, I, I consider this a continuously updated algorithm, would you say that's... Yeah, I, I, I would say that's true. Um, there, are, there are ways for, um, you can batch the updates together. Um, you know, it, it's, it's more efficient, say, to run 
this algorithm through, you know, the house algorithm through 10 inputs, and then calculate the total error, and then back propagate with the, with the total error as opposed to each individual error. But it, yeah, oh, it, it can be continuously updated, especially in an actor state model. That's the best way to go. So typically, typically it goes into, it, it usually operates in two modes, training or inference. So training means that it's just like Milo described it, you're constantly updating the model. And then once you're done, you deploy your solution, your weights to those, to those edges, to the field. So a self-driving car, for example, would not be learning while driving. It would be just implementing whatever solution was deployed in the field. But the training model would continue to learn, and then once it feels that it knows what the next solution should be, it would deploy that solution to the field. But just to be clear, I think anything that's deployed in the field doesn't typically doesn't learn, because uh, that would be too dangerous, because you would be learning different things, and all the products will be behaving differently. My understanding is the data that it gathers as, as the, uh, you know, self-driving cars, for example, are driving around, can then be used to tweak the model, you know, in some development environment, and That's then right. the, those tweaks based on that data can later be deployed. That's and correct. that probably, you know, it's, it's debatable whether that would count as continuous updating, because it's definitely not online as it's being updated. But the data is, you know, the data that's generated through the active state model can then be used to feedback into yep. training the algorithm. Yep. Are there any examples of AI that that currently is learning in real time and, and, and adjusting its behavior in real time and not being tested first? Um, none that I know of. Is that something that could potentially happen someday? Well, I can see it happening right now. It, it just depends on how you how you update your algorithm and, and whether you decide to update it online or in some kind of development environment. So uh, I understand this is the end of the hood uh, description about how it works. Let's go back to the definition. I, I think that we were kind of struggling with the idea of a relatively short, mm -hmm. maybe a sentence, uh, relatively simple uh, definition of what AI is. Is that possible mm -hmm. or do we have to do this? I, I think so. I, I think it's Milo? possible. Yeah, Milo. Hey, Milo. Hello. How are you? Is that John? I, I, I have a, do you have a chart deck or something that you're presenting? Because I don't see anything. Well, that's that's because actually um, the the computer I'm working on, it, there, there are technical difficulties. We're unable to get it to connect to the TV. I, I did get the, the presentation that you sent me, though, and it was very informative. Is oh, no, no, I don't, you don't have to use it. I'm just thinking the answer to the question, I think, about, uh, about real-time learning. I would say things like Siri and Alexa are examples of things that have sort of a continuous uh, evolution based on, you know, people's asking habits and stuff like that. Would you say that that's a real-time untested learning? I mean, it's tested in some sense, but not from a safety standpoint. But I don't think those are safety-specific things. I just that is an, uh, uh, an example of something that is real-time learning. Mm. You buy that? That that makes sense. Yeah, I I think yes. so. Also, um, those uh, the auto correction of your keyboards um, often use yeah. neural networks, um, which are updated on the fly based on their reward signal. Yeah, do you also pick up uh, accents, John? So accents of different speakers would be something that you would maybe deploy at the edge. These are the yeah. inference devices. Yeah, exactly. So, so Milo, I just have one more question. Because mm -hmm. part of our work is to be looking at recommendations down the road. Currently, are, is there any limitations um, on deploying AI that, are there any limitations on allowing, you, know, you were just talking about how there's people it's the developers are imposing a limit, that they're gathering data, they're testing it, and then they're deploying what, what the machines learn. And that sounds like a self-imposed limit. Is, are, is that, is the only limit right now self-imposed limits? Like in other words, or, or can, can people freely deploy the technology um, without testing it in a lab first? There are other people in this room who could better speak to the legality of various um, algorithm implementations, but my understanding 
is that uh, it, it depends on what your state of responsibility is to your client, what the effect of some kind of malfunction in your algorithm would be, and um, how, how you describe to your client um, how your algorithm works. If you make it clear that your algorithm is updated on the fly with data that it gathers, and that um, you know its behavior could change from, from time to time based on inputs that it receives, then, as I said, other people could better speak to the legality of that. I think it's, I think it's limited by the companies that are deploying it because this is just hardware and software, right? Right now, nobody really, I don't think anybody has insight into Microsoft software or anybody else's hardware, really. So. Yeah, it, uh, it, it, as long as your example is something like Alexa, uh, I don't think anybody wants to regulate what Alexa says to you. Uh, I, of course, Alexa might defraud you, I assume. Uh, if it got to that point, you would just be using pre-existing legal principles to say, wait, well, obviously you can't do that. But um, the minute you get into applications that might invade privacy, uh, particularly, I'd say that's a very, very sensitive area. Um, or uh, give human control to something else, uh, like a, uh, a automated vehicle. I'm trying to figure out whether it's autonomous or automated. But autonomous vehicle, which uh, will uh, not be aiding human driving, if itself will be doing it itself then you've got a particular uh, choice that you need to talk about regulating uh, if that's the way you choose to, to go, of course. And all of those things are in the future. This is where technology outstrips regulation at this point. Also, one thing that I would add about um, all of this is that traditional models are designed to be transparent in that um, you know, statistical modeling, like you know, something that a, a statistician would come up with themselves, it is designed so that any statistician who finds it can understand what variables are at play. You know, um, the, the example I gave in the very beginning of, um, of saying that a house's value in general increases $1,000 for each window that's added, or $2,000 per you know, 1,000 square feet that are added. That is, is designed to be you know, very understandable to humans. But um, when, when models are able to update themselves, like in, in neural networks, it's a lot harder to understand what's happening under the hood. Um, you know, even even someone who you know knows how a, a neural network works doesn't necessarily know why a certain neuron has the value it does. And when neurons are, are are trained in a neural network, they're often initialized with completely random values and then are, are tuned to to their optimal values. But those optimal values can can change. Uh, depending on what the initial random values are, which makes it very hard to know um, what, what a neural network is, is doing and possibly debug potential biases that it would have. And I think that's another important thing to explore is how transparency figures into this, because that's something that, um, that companies with really high risk w would need to be able to explain to, to people whose money is in their hands, for example, um, Exactly how those algorithms work, and, and you know what what they're putting at risk. Did we answer the question, John's question about a sentence definition? You uh, did say in the very beginning you had a one sentence definition. Do you want to repeat that? The sentence definition that I worked with is um, a, a a model um, which is able to. Hmm. What's it? Oh, okay. uh, so an, an algorithm which is able to display traits which are traditionally considered human, like the ability to uh, to learn or update its its internal state to optimize itself to a given task. So can we make a definition without using the word algorithm? Hmm. Uh, trying to get one that is. Uh, if you walk into a legislative committee, which is what we're reporting to, right, and you said, here's what AI is, everybody in the room would immediately understand that. The problem uh, that Milo, <laughs> uh, if you use that chart, you know, the, the one that I, I, that I have of, of four boxes, you know, artificial intelligences, and I, I, I had uh, some, I thought, pretty jargon-free sentences there. Did you try that? 
Um, as I said, I don't have my computer up right now. Um, Is it on Slack, John? Uh, no, but it can be. Or just email. Uh, give me, give me two seconds. Uh, also, John, the, the, the information from that Montreal conference that you put on Slack does include a definition in the beginning. Uh, it's yeah, that might be. It, was that was, I, thought, I thought it was a, a pretty uh, jargon-free. I'm using that term, you know, sure. just something that was sure. really understandable. But a uh, jet like Milo is compared to, and yours may be, uh, something that was assumed to uh, be a product only of human intelligence that now is capable of being done uh, without human uh, development. Let me, um, I'm going to put this on Slack right now, but I don't, I don't know that it's necessarily better. I, it, it sounds to me like you, you put the right thing in here. So um, just uh, mm. I, I have it right now, but it's hmm. here. I think if I can plug in. Oh, okay, sure, so, yeah. Uh, just take this. Oh, do you have that? Oh, sure. <laughs> I've always found that a group that's talking about technology has the least ability to use that. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm talking. Do you understand the challenge? That's far. <laughs> So you have Webster's dictionary explanation of it, definition. A branch of computer science dealing with simulation of intelligent behaviors in computers. Hmm. If anything, it's, it's really just a... Uh, there it is. Sorry, Slack is on. Maybe okay, mute that's your good. mic on your, uh, on your computer. <laughs> so, John, did you put it on there? He said, um, yeah, the latest. Um, uh, hang on one second. I think uh, I put a link to it, um, but it seems to be. Keep going. It's not more. It's not more. If it's there, is that it? Right there? Yeah, yeah, that must be it. Okay, do you see four Milo? Yeah, we're opening it up right now. Yeah. So it's showing the evolution of AI, blue boxes, artificial intelligence down to deep learning, machine <coughs> learning, neural networks. So, programs with the ability to learn and reason like humans. AI algorithms that learn, uh, that's artificial intelligence, but that could be explicitly or implicitly programmed. Machine learning is AI algorithms that learn without needing to be explicitly programmed, so that's distinct from rules-based AI. Neural networks are machine learning things that are based on, you know, roughly on the, the sort of neural model, which I think you've defined, uh, I probably already talked about my own, which is sort of like brain structures. And deep neural networks is just more of the same with computer, with uh, you know hardware acceleration so they can work on huge data. That's the best I've ever been able to find. Did those work? Yeah, yeah sure. I think oh. we replaced the word algorithm with the word program. Yes, yeah, so I see. Uh, yeah. Like deep learning, this is true, but others work on massive amounts of data. I, everybody's working to learn with less and less data. Uh, I think IBM has been for the, the, I mean, the top definition makes the most sense to me. Well, yeah, yeah it's supposed to be the Well, you can replace so. programs with methods or recipes or effectively. It is a, an approach that really doesn't follow uh, humans programming the, how the data will be processed. It's actually the machines figure out how the data is processed based on examples and yeah, they learn like toddlers. Makes sense because humans act unreasonably most of the time. <laughs> it seems like the machine learning, neural networks, and deep learning are more the methodologies that that That's correct. kind of result yeah. in that outcome, and maybe they all differ a little bit in the level of you know precision, or you know that they're able to do that, learn and reason, and 
And I think the legislature should be in the broad sense. I don't think you guys should focus on specific implementations or architectures or topologies. It should be the general, uh, all-encompassing umbrella. Okay. Is that a symbol that you liked it, or? <laughs> John, are you still there? Yeah, I'm sorry, did you say it? Yeah. I, I think we're all we're good, right? Yeah. This for now. I mean, yeah. What are we supposed are, to do? Are you okay with that? Good. I think it's helpful. I mean, it seems does it seem helpful that top definition as as uh, so this is now on Slack, uh, and this is what you were gonna uh, use, Milo. You were you gonna use this? PowerPoint, or you had your own? Oh no, I was going to use this one actually. Ah, okay. So, uh, so now it's on Slack, and we can go and consult it, and maybe mm -hmm. next meeting you have a create a, uh, a, a, a voter definition, I guess. Question I have yeah. about this is not so much a definition, but are there are there like are there physical constraints now in terms of like our processing power and computing power and that you know, sort of standing in the way of fully realizing that um, that definition, you know, so maybe sort of reason and and learn like humans, but not quite yet. I mean, we do image recognition now. Machines can do image recognition better than humans can. So we already have these type of definitions, right? So image recognition from deep learned neural networks, which is really the subset of these, is already doing better at the image recognition than humans will. We're at the 3% whereas humans' ability to recognize specific images is about 5% there. So I think you're already there. I think one technological development which will aid uh, the training of, of neural networks and, and AI in general is uh, quantum computers because they have the ability to solve optimization problems um, in, in you know, uh, oh, oh, one time, or, or with that. Uh, Real time, very fast. Yeah, yeah, very quickly, yeah. faster than other algorithms could. Joe, I think the answer is yes. Uh, yeah, I think that, that's going to be very, very important in the future. I just do want to say that while there's a lot of promise there, nobody's been able to demonstrate that yet, but I believe that once that happens, I think there will be other breakthroughs too in our ability to accelerate these things within a certain cost and power envelope yeah. that will, will also matter a lot. But this it's advancing so fast. I mean, did you see the charts I had put out there about how fast uh, AI is advancing in terms of both technology and interest? I saw that, but uh, I wasn't able to project it. We can't. Uh, no problem. Uh, yeah, it's those, those are out I saw it on Slack. You had just put it on. Recently, but it was the last thing you put on. So uh, this this is kind of today. But if you um, if you actually look at it, there was there was a uh, uh, in the in the chart I just posted. What one thing I, I would call your attention to is like maybe on the uh, the one two three fourth page that might be a little cryptic. Oh, didn't even come out right, but. Um, what that shows is that there was kind of a big bang in 2012 where there's a, there are a, some canonical problems that people solve at every technology generation just to gauge progress in algorithms and, and compute, et cetera. And there's one that's called ImageNet, which is characterizing and labeling about a million images from the, from the internet. You know, just uh, that's a cat, that's a dog, that's a, you know, an explosion, whatever. And you see that uh, the accuracy percentage from 2010 to 2011 kind of went down. 2012 was when people started applying um, uh, GPU, uh, graphics processors, to acceleration. And then you see how quickly <laughs> the accuracy percentages improved. And that green bar is sort of the, the accuracy of a human in, in his or her ability to actually you know, identify the same pictures. And so you see this precipitous drop that started in 2012, and it, it continues to go down, meaning that the accuracy of the matching is now superhuman, and the speed is, 
you know, outrageously superhuman. And so that, that kind of advance, like my little, the kind of thing you're talking about with uh, quantum, will be yet another you know, advance both in the, in the accuracy and the timing because it, the, the, the two things are somewhat trade-offable. You know, the more, the more compute you can put to something, the more accurate it can be in the same amount, in, the, in a tolerable amount of time. So that's kind of interesting. And, and superimposed on that red line is just kind of my lame way of showing how interest is scaled. That's just the, uh, the text didn't come out. If you download the PowerPoint, you'll be able to see some of the other text on the screen. That's how many people enrolled in the beginning AI course at MIT. So if you download the PowerPoint, you'll actually be able to see that from 2013, from 300 people, it's now standing room only at almost 1,000 people. With, with respect to the agenda and speakers, could we move on to other, the speakers portion of this, or are we still discussing? Can we, yeah. Oh, oh, yeah. I, I just, can I have a question? Or is there anything else left to discuss? At this time, or can it be at a later date and time? Um, I'm I'm willing to discuss anything at a later date. John, are you are you okay with that? Yes. Is there anything else you'd like to add? Totally. Totally. All right. Okay. Uh, Joe. Okay. Go so um, before I start talking about automated business, I just want to say a little bit about the subcommittee that has pulled together all the witnesses today, just to remind everybody, this is the Transportation, Technology, Manufacturing, Construction, Labor Subcommittee. <laughs> so that's why we have, we have quite a few witnesses. So we have the first part is uh, we're going to be talking about transportation. So me talking about um, automated vehicles, Steve Law talking about how AI is being used, I guess, in transportation planning and analysis. and. Um, and Guy, or who else we're talking about, uh, AI <laughs> as it relates to aviation. <laughs> and then, then the second, then we'll break, and then the second part is um, really about the manufacturing and construction side of things. And um, I'm sorry, I'm going to all that. Igor is one of our speakers, and um, Tom Kennedy is he here yet? <coughs> is, um, Joe, Joe Ackerman, or Joey Ackerman from He's still playing, being Engineers yet. Construction. And then Jim's going to be from the labor perspective. So with that, that's all. I'll, I'll get started. Um, hey, John, I don't know how to show you my, I do actually have a, a PowerPoint here because it helps me, keeps me, my thoughts organized, and there's some, some topic that's just, okay. So, but, I have um, a good imagination. Okay. No problem. <laughs> so um, the, the first thing I, I just want to share is like, this is generally the type of equipment that's on a self driving so it has you know, radar that can identify how close it is to other vehicles. Um, LiDAR, which like, sends out a point cloud and can kind of get a 3D view of the world around it. Um, and there's uh, the ability to connect with other vehicles and other infrastructure like traffic signals on board, dedicated uh, short range communication. Um, and then there's software, which is really where the um, AI lives, right? And um, you know, the more I'm learning about this, and the task force is kind of, and I have to say with transportation, a lot of what I've been thinking about is more on the policy level and taking it for granted that the AI is going to be able to drive the car. And you know, so it's kind of jumping to that highest level of AI. Um, and, and I think in Vermont, one challenge that we might have is if that AI has to be computed in the cloud, so to speak, you know, if, there, if it can't really be done on board, that can be a challenge for us, just given our limited cell coverage, right? Something as simple as that. Um, if it is capable, that's kind of what I was asking the question about, what are the constraints to be able to run through these gigantic neural networks to say, oh, that's a cat in the middle of the road, I better slow down, you know? And um, so if that can't really be done on board, that's gonna be a challenge for us here. And I don't that must be done on board. I don't think there's an option of actually. It must be done on board. It is. I actually drove a car from Williston to here from the entrance of Williston Highway to here, I didn't really have to touch the car. It would, it would drive all the way through, and that's like current cars. <laughs> yeah, yeah. That's that was like the Tesla, I think. Yeah, the Tesla, you could, right? yeah. yeah. So you don't need the, the cell coverage or anything to actually have that. Yeah. Or right. If you're going to do more, I mean, the cat in the road, I understand. But if you're going to choose a route based on getting information in that tells you what uh, 
is clogged or what might have obstacles or, yeah. uh, or whatever, you're going to end up uh, somehow having to connect up and get it. Uh, and, right. and that's only the simplest of information you might want to know in order to decide how to drive from A to B. Yeah, so there's sort of the tactical, dynamic driving task elements of driving self-driving cars, you know, steering, moving forward, braking, interpreting the environment around you, acting accordingly. Then there's the more strategic type decision, which is I want to go from Wellston to National Life. And you know, those those decisions are still going to be sort of input by the human, right? I want to go from here to there. And you know, even now you can use navigation and it's it's not totally reliable, right? We still have trucks that go over a smuggler's notch in the wintertime, for example. But I think that that is something that is it can be mitigated. As long as, even if they choose the incorrect route, as long as they're traveling safely on the incorrect route. I think that's like a human. That's always the premise for yeah. self-driving cars. Is yeah. they, they don't need any connectivity to anything else to actually operate safely. I think and, that's the And that's really helpful to me yeah. because I've kind of been saying that. Or like, in order for them to really work in Vermont, you know, that's going to have to be the case. Um, if we want I to, think, yeah. Yeah, isn't it, isn't it sort of, I mean, I think I heard someone say the same thing. It's sort of nuanced. I mean, there are, there are mission critical things that absolutely have to be local and have to be able to work like collision avoidance and lane changes and things like that, that you can't have a round trip, uh, you can't have a cloud connection on. But then there are things like navigation and, and things like that that happen to look that are less mission critical and happen on lower latency. So you will, you'll have kind of a hybrid of both, right? Yeah. And you might have, you know, you might, uh, one thing that's very interesting, for example, is that in, in sort of uh, recent uh, automated driving or, or highly assisted driving that like when your ABS system goes off, like when your, your, your car is adjusted is slippery roads, it could network back and share with nearby cars to say, don't you don't have to wait until you start picking this up. There's ice up ahead. Right. So there's there there are kind of different latencies, of mission critical and less mission critical, that involve certain types of connectivity. And there are a lot of people who are saying that with 5G everything will be able to be in the cloud. I will go on record as saying that'll never happen. You never really can rely on anything non local. That's just me being grouchy. Uh, I, uh, there was a, a book uh, reviewed in the New York Times uh, two weeks ago, I think, or Sunday, uh, New York Times, that I picked up and did a quick read on. I'll, give, I'll put the name on Slack. It's really quite, quite good. And one of the things it emphasizes is that for full AI potential, cars need to talk to each other. Um, they, right. have to, they have to do uh, things in relation to what other things are doing. But of course, that creates all this data about where things are located and, and has its own set of problems uh, to do it. But that, that yeah. is an essential part of the AI, AI development at this point. I mean, we have currently cars, Ford is working with Domino's, they deliver pizza in fully self-driving self cars right now. There's nobody in the car, they deliver the pizza, the, the car pulls in your driveway, you enter a code and you get a pizza. So we already have that enabled, despite the fact that there's no 5G anywhere right. deployed at this point. So, so oh yeah. this uh, next slide is uh, just showing the five different levels of automation. And uh, you know, levels one and two are really pretty simple technology and human is clearly you know, responsible and in control. Um, you know, things like adaptive control is an example of that. You know, the, the Tesla is, you know, the autopilot is kind of on, this is, you know, this shows steps in it, but it's really more of probably a, you know, continuity, you know, than it is like all of a sudden you jump off to the next level. And these are really just for guidance purposes, not like that super specific, but um, so like the Tesla autopilot is more of a level two because you, you really can't completely let, let it go. You need to stay aware and be ready to take over control. Um, and that's kind of gets into the level three, and that's like a, uh, the definition of level three is the human always has to be ready to take control. The vehicle can do all the dynamic driving tasks, tasks, but the human has to be ready. And that's the level that gives you know, most regulators the, 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 it's one of the biggest challenge because you know, we know we can sort of lose our attention easily even with cruise control. And so when, you know, there's an example, there was a recent uh, news story about uh, driver was under the influence and he was in a Tesla, fell asleep, 
and the vehicle kept moving, and the, the only way the police could pull him over was to get out in front of him and somehow slow, slow it down, <laughs> right? And so it's possible that the, the technology sort of let him drop his guard enough to sort of the influence that he fell asleep. And it was at the same time, story. it may have saved uh, his the, life, too. The police guy knew enough to just get in front of him and then just start slowing down the car with collision avoidance just stopped the car. And then they had a bang on the window and the guy kind of woke up. It was like, really? Yeah. I didn't even know the, my wife was asking, you know, what are they charging with? I, I guess it's DWI, right? Yeah. Yeah, so I mean, but that's that's the challenge, I think, is there's still that high level of human interaction. And level four um, has the same, the vehicle has, this, has the ability to do all the dynamic driving tasks, but it's generally designed to operate what they call operational design domain. So it could be like on a college campus, it could be certain time of day, certain weather conditions, certain facilities, like just on the interstate. And what distinguishes it, it from level three is that it can get into a minimal risk condition. So if a human does not respond, that the car has the ability to kind of pull over or find some other safe spot. Like the example I just gave you, the Tesla did not have the ability to do that. The level five is completely autonomous. So that, you know, no steering wheel, no brakes, no human drive. So how far are we technologically from level five? Now I'm not talking about all the policy questions, I'm yeah. talking about all the human questions. I'm just saying the technology can produce a level five car. We already have we already have them deployed delivering pizza, as I mentioned. It's a I'm not sure it's totally a time. Do you have Steve? Go ahead. Yeah, no, we're we're 20 years away or more. I mean, the, 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 I mean, I don't get this. Let me just answer the one question directly, which is, um, in in a defined environment, we have that today. Yep. So uh, in situations where you describe, you know, you do a uh, geofence, and you say within this area we're going to operate in an, uh, 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 you know, an autonomous vehicle. That works. We can do that. But as soon as we get outside of those constraints, either you know, bad weather or you know uh, roads that are uh, uh, unusual in some characteristics, or all those things, you know, those problems, those edge problems, aren't solved. So you know, we'll get ninety percent of the way there in the next you know handful of years. That last ten percent, though, you know, who knows? And I suspect, I mean, I'm seeing nods, it sounds, so we, yeah, I mean, that's my answer. The geofence, I, I totally agree. I think all the fully autonomous cars right now are geofenced. Yeah, right? You can't, more you can't level pull them or More level four, like, because you're, you're, you're saying you're limited to a certain... Or, or they're level five, but within a constraint. Exactly. So let me give you an example. There's a, I'm sorry, yeah, I'm just trying to answer this question. Let me shut up, because you've got to go back to your thing. But um, <laughs> in Florida, the villages, and I guess, or where the villages, sort of very, very large, um, you know, adult, uh, um, um, old age homes, whatever, whatever the right terminology is for that. Senior um, living. Senior <laughs> living. <laughs> <and everybody. laughs> Retirement communities. This is not for this language, right? Um, very large, um, a robust network within the, you know, roadway network within it, but fairly constrained, right? You know where the roads are, you know where the people are, you know what's going on, you can do all sorts of things. Um, Right now, we have autonomous vehicles operating pretty successfully in that environment, and uh, you know it's a perfect environment because you know it, it's it's well, for all the reasons you can imagine. Um, so in that area, what I would say is it's level five, but um, with a, in a very constrained environment, right? So follow up: Can you be at level five or level four without everyone being at level four and level five? Uh, in other words. Can you have some zeros interacting with uh, autonomous vehicles in four and five and without problem? Yep. You can. Um, you don't gain quite the level of optimization that you do as you start to approach things like connected vehicles and things you were referring to, uh, where you can get a lot more advantage for that, but you can operate in that environment. Okay. I want to ask a simple question. When you said you can fully automated ride, you were talking about being in a it's four a, it, or a three, a two but or three, it's yeah. full. It, so that's a highway people. statement, right? So on the highway, the car can recognize Mark's well. He's right. If it's snow, it might basically tell you, you got to take over. I'm not, I'm not doing this. It will, it will give you an alarm. But you can just click on it, and it will drive. It will actually shift lanes if somebody's too slow in front of you. It will pass them. It will keep doing all. So you just have to monitor it. So the statement is, 
this is not a fully autonomous car, you better hold on to the steering wheel, but the technology is there to actually to, get you, to press what I can see if you, if you decided, so, yeah. Was, was the car a commercial U.S. sold car? I mean, yeah. that ADAS, that's called, what is it called, Advanced Driver Assistance, that's pretty, I've been in Germany, and a lot of my friend's cars have level three. Yep. They, yep. I think it's level three. But I, I'm not aware that other than Tesla that there are many commercial U.S. cars is that true? Yeah, so this, true? this is a Tesla Model 3, John, but you're right, uh, Audi has the, their, uh, their level 3 car, they're the first ones that do release, I think, a model, uh, level 3 uh, capable car. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So this kind of just leads me to my next slide, which is like, how fast are they going to penetrate the market? And this, this forecast was done by the Governor's Highway Safety Association, and kind of looking at vehicle turnover, the cost of the technology, and some other factors. And, and the prediction is that the next 10 years, maybe 1 to 2% of the vehicles on the road could be some level of automation, so 3, 4, or 5. You know, we're sort of seeing, seeing that happen now. And then, you know, out to the 2050, 2050s, no more than, you know, 40 to 60% of the fleet. So, you know, this challenge of the mix of vehicles on the road is going to exist for you know really the foreseeable future. And so that's one forecast. And another forecast is uh, it's by this group called Re, uh, Rethink X, and they sort of looking at disruptive transportation. And and it's you know they're saying when you look at other technology, it's not as linear as it has been in the past, and that um, they think that the benefits of you know the cost savings and the convenience really make a huge difference and there'll be a much bigger turnover um, so that you know 95 90 percent of the passenger miles driven will be in shared autonomous vehicles um, and, they, and the sharing is really critical because that's how you reduce the costs um, and potentially save 5600 per year per household you know because maybe you don't have two cars and all that and yeah John. It seems to me that number one one raises a, a question for me that I didn't find the answer in the book and I'm interested in, in generally. There's kind of a link between shared and electric. There's a, there's a link now between autonomous vehicles and the fact that we're going to be electric vehicles. But I don't understand technologically why that They're not link right. is there. They're not. Uh, you could have a uh, autonomous vehicle that was, in t it was simply a gas guzzling. Uh, <laughs> It, uh, I think it's linked to drive-by-wire. I don't know if anybody else in the room, Joe, but yeah. the idea that, 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 that if you still have mechanical linkages for everything, brakes, uh, steering and stuff, where a human is still an impossibility, it, it's one kind of uh, uh, electromechanical control. And when you completely sever that and all of that is done electronically, it makes it much easier to control by computer. So I think they're, they're linked in that way. The more drive-by-wire you are, uh, you know, in terms of how the car works, the more automatable it is. Is that, is that fair statement? I think, John, you're right. It makes it easier if all the systems were electrical. But I mean, the Audis, for example, are gas engines that are uh, level three. Um, um, there's a lot of level twos that are also that also steer, uh, keep you lane assist, they keep you in the lane. Um, I, I don't know, but I agree with you. In general, we're moving the two trends in the same direction quickly, both electric cars as well as autonomous cars. So they're most likely to be married down the road. But I think I that there's a exclusive. hope. I think it's maybe more of a hope than it is <laughs> a reality in that. The thinking is, well, if, the simplistic explanation I've heard is, you know, you're automated vehicle will drop you off and you can go to charge. You know, so it can start to deal with the range anxiety a little bit. Um, that doesn't help you if you're doing a long trip, right? You still need to stop and get charged along the way. So, I mean, I'm pointing this out only because there's kind of these two extremes about how fast it will happen, but even in this scenario, they're saying, in, you know, even within 10 years, 40% of the fleet are still going to be conventional vehicles. Which people are probably still going to want to drive, especially just in 10 years, right? In Vermont, our average age of a car is 10 years. So it takes much longer than that for the complete fleet to turn over. Um, this, uh, I found this article is really interesting just about the investment, and these are the, this is tracking the transactions and anything related to automated vehicles. You know, so it could be the sensors or it could be the computing systems, but you just see this huge jump in 2016. 
you know, almost zero in 2014 to $80 billion um, in a really short time frame. So, you know, people are putting their money where their mouths are and they're taking kind of the risks here. Uh, maybe there's some hype around this and they're investing in it and hoping for a great return, but it kind of is an interesting indicator. And maybe there was something, uh, John, you know, was showing a slide that something happened in two, 2012, maybe there was some kind of breakthrough that, you know. Well, the breakthrough was image recognition, as John pointed out, yeah. which is the key technology needed for self-driving cars. Without it, you would not have self-driving cars, right? It would be hard to do. It, yeah, and the and the the technological advancement in that made image recognition was kind of a combination of sort of algorithmic refinement, but it really involved uh, you know kind of uh, numeric acceleration at the edge. Yeah, so things like Movidius and those those kind of platforms where you had a special purpose acceleration hardware computation hardware at the edge. So that so, so you're doing, that's great. that's what made image at the edge possible, I think. So, you know, there's indications that there's changes coming, right? And then there's still a question about how fast that can be absorbed by the public. And there's definitely, the public is skeptical, there's, you know, uh, trust and technical issues. And so this is just, uh, you know, what are the benefits? These are the fatalities. And this is what we often hear transportation people talk about first when it comes to driving cars. So these are the number of fatalities in the U.S. in 2017. Vermont, we have uh, about 60 fatalities a year. Um, and so the thought is you remove the human and you know you can start addressing some of the you know, safety issues. 90% or so are behavior. That's another thing you hear everybody start their presentations off with talking about self-driving cars. But you know, the other benefits of what we talked about, mobility, um, people that can't currently drive, um, you know, I think remaining economically competitive is another benefit, you know, as these things roll out, is Vermont going to be ready for them? Um, potentially environment, if you buy the, you know, electric vehicle connection. And so um, there, there's a number of potential benefits. Um, and, yeah. But, but, and the, the 37, what is it, 37,461 deaths, oh, I would guess, this, uh, in the year, you can dramatically reduce that by the technology without going all the way to Olympic Park. Yes. Uh, many of the things yes. you've got here, uh, you can have an alcohol breath test uh, in a lock. I mean, you've got all sorts of technological possibilities that are coming out of this, maybe on the way to Thomas vehicles, but would greatly reduce this right. without going all the way. Yeah, and another, <laughs> you know, another technology which you touched on here a little bit is just the idea of connected vehicles. So vehicles connected to traffic signals, vehicles connected to each other. Again, the human is still in control, but hopefully getting better information and making better decisions. And avoiding collisions with other vehicles and so on. And a lot of DOTs are really interested in pushing that because they kind of recognize we don't have, we don't control the deployment of automated vehicles, right? Uh, I think the public sector is not. Well, I mean, it's the manufacturers making the investments and taking the risk, but we do control the infrastructure and we can do some changes. <coughs> Another key benefit of this is also, as you mentioned, the vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication. You can actually utilize your resources much better. Your roads can actually now hold four times as many cars because you're not leaving gaps between starts and stops. All the cars can kind of start moving at the same time because they know when to move and when to stop. Four so times seem, kind of, seems kind of high to me. <laughs> that's, that's, a, that's a California <laughs> utilization, the, the, the rule of thumb that they're using for, wow. for the amount of cars they can put on the same roads. Of course, part of this is will the car look the same? if it were fully automated entirely. I mean, you've got the risk that they look like houses, I suppose. Everybody will sit back and then want to recline on the TV or whatever. I don't know. The other thing is you can make them in the shape that fits on the roads as opposed to like that. Yeah, yeah. People are talking about you can have a, you feel like exercising on the way to work, you can have an exercise car pick you up. Yeah. Do you want to watch a movie, you can have a movie car pick you up, especially if you're sharing cars between different, uh, so I'm a I'm kind of behind nice schedule, so I don't know how you want to handle you know, this. So so what are the I mean you're already already in the middle of this. What are the policy yeah. questions that are looming that um, we should be concerned about as a as a task force? Well, I want to get recommendations. So I think in the short term, you know, um, I've been advocating for suggesting that you know, Vermont should allow for testing of automated vehicles on public roads. 
and putting in a relatively you know, non burdensome process to allow that. I think the public has a right to know what's going to happen. I'm not sure people are lining up. I know people aren't lining up right now, but sort of be prepared for that. And you know, that's a fundamental question. Should um, public highways be used to test vehicles? It sort of goes back to the neural network question. It's like, after it's kind of run through a bunch of iterations and, and have been tested in you know, similar circumstances without exposing it to the public, are there enough potential benefits in the long term that we want to allow these vehicles to be tested on public roads? Certainly, lots of other states are doing that. Our neighbors are doing it. You know, it's happening all over the country. So that's one question. And the other question, and you know, I've, I have draft legislation that we may, set, we may work on for this year. The other part of it is, assuming these vehicles are on the market, you know, they're starting to come on the market, what are some common sense regulations to allow them to drive legally on Vermont highways. And, and getting into the nuances somewhat between levels three, four, and five. Even if five are down the road a little bit, like what, when should these vehicles be allowed on the roads? What who's responsible, who's liable? That that those are some really big questions. And I think from that side you'll see actually two waves of, of, of car deployment of self of fully autonomous cars. I think maybe the personal fully autonomous cars are maybe a little bit further out, but you will see uh, commercial vehicles that can pay the hundreds of thousands of dollars to enable full driving for like trucks or semis, those are gonna be, those are gonna wanna be driving on our highways much sooner than you'll see commercial vehicles, like a private vehicles. So right. Yeah, the whole idea of truck platooning is another big question for us, and, which is basically technology allows the vehicles, the trucks to, to travel much closer together. You know, they, they, there would still be drivers in all the trucks, but they wouldn't necessarily have to be in full control. And, um, the main thing is the spacing, the use of the spacing. Right now in Vermont, we have, a con it's, we have a convoy law that prohibits vehicles traveling closer than 1,000 feet together that are the same, you know, which if you think about it is a little bit ridiculous and I don't think it's all enforceable, but that's what, it, that's what the law says. Um, so what can we do? This is bringing up the ownership question. I, I, yeah. I guess I have a little concern about thousands and thousands and thousands of more vehicles uh, on, on the roads, if that's the direction right we're going into, and uh, what 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 might choose you the other way that we yeah. uh, find develop encourage or whatever a shared ownership uh, 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 transportation as a service right. uh, and make investments in that side. So uh, yeah, that's um, some of the you know, so these are definitely the longer term questions, right? The, the initial questions is just mitigating the risk short term. Long term is there's always pricing strategies, which in Vermont, you know, can be hard to implement, but um, if these vehicles are really, you know, connected, there can be certainly different, you know, cost structures for different times of day to kind of shift things off peak and so on. I think I think the pricing structure is going to happen more naturally and through the market. Like simply if you um, you know if you've ever used Uber, you have an option. If you want to share a ride with somebody, it will cost you less money. You don't want to share a ride, it'll cost you more money. So um, that might happen naturally anyway. But there's also a lot of, you know, if we kind of always come back to some of these smart growth strategies. It's like the way, even if you have a shared driving scenario where more and more people are sharing rides, it's going to be much more efficient if people are located closer together. At least one end of their trip is located closer together. So it makes sense to share rides. So we get back to the land use again. Mixed use concentrated development separating my open countryside. We sort that's like, John, you might, you were in the Cuban administration, right, when Act 200 was kind of put into place, and it's like that still kind of holds water, right? It makes a lot of sense to do that no matter what the transportation option is. Joe, uh, this seems like a very interesting topic to everyone. Well, yeah, we are. And I'm sure you're not done with all your slides. Maybe Steve, um, that's okay. Now that is, is this a good time to say the or the should, Ron Digger article. <laughs> should, should we say should we save this your or the rest of your uh, presentation maybe till the next meeting? If you want more information on it, sure, but we just post it and I think you know as we deliberate later on about um, what our recommendations will be, you know, I'm, I'm here, I'm not a witness, so I'm gonna get the whole week to talk more about it. Uh, I am interested in what you think the labor and uh, implications are of this. I think that I don't know what Maybe Jill can touch on that. Because uh, obviously, uh, drivers of various kinds, trucks uh, and uh, taxis and Ubers, and yeah. all other things, is a pretty substantial 
fighting to live. Yeah, and my, you know, my sort of take on this, my view is that the transition is probably going to happen slow, yeah. and there'll be a time to adjust, and um, that's kind of the hope. So, anyway, we should glad to see my time, or actually, I don't. You don't have any time left. You <laughs> <laughs> borrowed. I'll take it away from somebody else. <laughs> yeah. Working at a desk. So Steve is next. Short. Sure. Do you want? Where do you want to come up? Yeah, come on. Next to you. Sure, wherever you'd like. Safe. So John, this is uh, Steve Watt from Resource Systems Group. Is there anybody else on the phone? I should ask. Oh, good. Oh, oh, I Nobody knows where they came from. Okay, okay. okay. So, uh, uh, Joe said no presentation, and then the last two have been no. The last two have Outstanding. I love it. It's an argument. Um, so uh, maybe just a moment on, on RSG, just as a, because you have my Bible, so I won't bother with, with me at all, but, but RSG is a, uh, a firm that's so uh, a spin-off of the engineering business school at Dartmouth College. Uh, it just so happens that AI harkens back to Dartmouth College in the mid-1950s, uh, um, at least that's some credit, uh, uh, a workshop at Dartmouth College with uh, the origins of AI. Um, we do predictive analytics and statistical modeling. That, that's what we do. And we do it around the country. We have offices around the country. We do a lot of work with uh, National Academy of Sciences, a lot of work with the uh, Highway Administration, uh, mostly in the transportation space, a little bit in the energy space, and a little bit in the health space. So, uh, and, and, and of course, as such, we, we've been working in, in this field for years and years and years. Yeah. So, um, I thought I might just um, start with a couple things. I, I thought I might just describe for a moment, um, you know, AI and how, how how I might define it, but also how I think about it, really more than a definition, uh, and then dive into a couple of things on the transportation side. And since you've done such a great job with this, I might just move a little bit more to um, some of the policy considerations that we're facing, and happy to answer any technical questions. Um, so here's a, here's a thought for you with regards to uh, definition. I'd say that it's elusive. I don't think you should find yourself too constrained by any one definition because neural nets are just one way to do AI. They're not the way to do AI. They're just one way, um, and so and, and they're um, you know and deep learning and and neural nets are uh, very popular and you see them a lot until we come up with something better and then they're going to be the one and something else will take its place. Um, so I mean, there's this thing called the AI effect, which is. Um, and, and I would describe it as, as, as follows. Um, technology has just been advancing over the years as we know. Computers are getting faster. We're getting more and more data um, at, at our disposal. Sensors are getting better. All these different things that are getting better and better. And so that which we called AI 10 years ago, now we just refer to it as, a, as an optimization model. Or it's a relatively trivial thing. Um, now AI is, um, is that highly complex, unique thing that is self-learning and self-adaptive and, and, and so on and so forth. But in 10 years' time, it may be something else yet again. So, um, so I guess that's just my, my comment about definition. I, I think pick one that works for you right now. Um, I would note that the past 10 minutes of the conversation hasn't really been at all about AI. So I just remind the committee of that. Um, uh, shared vehicles, not AI. Uh, uh, connected vehicles, not AI. Um, autonomous vehicles, sure. There's a lot within autonomous vehicles that are that are AI. There's no need to go to level five to get really interesting like fun and crash prediction models that we have right now. All the things that we have that prefer to um, more efficient, more safe driving, all these types of things. Um, those for sure are using AI technologies and, and that, you know, sort of um, whatever, whatever you want to call it, algorithms and, and different methods. Um, so I, I just I just think that it's you know go wherever you want as a committee, but I would alert you to the fact that you know um, um, if you're really on an AI um, direction, then I mean, um, watch yourself with regards to kind of where it goes because it's pretty fascinating stuff. And all that's incredibly important, but not necessarily AI. So um, and I, yeah, I sorry. Throw in, uh, 
that there's, you know, there have been uh, multiple times in the past where somebody said, okay, this is going to be AI. There have been two AI winters where things were looking good, the industry geared up, and then it crashed, and all the jobs went away. So I think your point is very good. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, and there will be yet more. I mean, I love that term, the AI winter. I know, I, you know, I, I, what does that mean? Well, it's, I mean, it is, it is like nuclear winter. It's like, you know, this fall off of, you know, there's this notion that in that some point in the near future, AI is going to solve everything, you know, and then it's like, boom, then it just drops and it, and, it, and it doesn't do that thing that we imagine it does, but then it takes off again. You know, all of a sudden we find another use for AI or another, or, you know, we, um, you know, whatever computing power increases in a way that otherwise, you know, and, and all of a sudden we're back in the game again, and AI has a whole new, um, it, all you know, life is, is um, breathed into AI again. So that's the AI winter uh, concept. But um, you know, okay. So so uh, hopefully that helps you just to think about AI. Um, with regards to transportation, um, I think there are two. And, and so um, actually, let me just say that. So that gives me a little bit of latitude, right, to talk about AI because now I've defined it pretty broadly, and I've said you know there's a lot that you can and cannot include in that. So. Now I've, I've set myself up to be flexible in this way. Um, but with regards to AI um, in the transportation space, um, you know, there, are, there are just an awful lot of really interesting things that are coming out. For sure, um, safety and, 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 and um, you know, near crash prediction models that exist today that allow us to, uh, um, you know, to determine uh, um, uh, um, with a fairly high level of precision and accuracy because of all the data we have at our disposal, um, you know, what is or is not causing accidents and what sort of behaviors uh, can allow us to avoid uh, accidents early, um, which is, of course, the thing that you're trying to do is to predict them as far in advance as possible so that you can um, make, you know, take corrective action. Eco driving is another major uh, thing that, you know, for sure it's, it's taken, it's, it's uh, um, you know, we've already gone past, you know, well past that notion uh, that uh, um, cars are now better uh, mechanically at being efficient than the drivers who drive them. I mean, that was that shift from um, standard vehicles to auto, uh, you know, to, uh, uh, you know, to a, uh, uh, an automatic vehicle, not an autonomous vehicle, an automatic vehicle. Um, and now they're just more efficient, they're just better. They, they're, they, they change and shift to change at the right time, all those things. That was a really early thing, nothing to do with AI, but um, we're just making um, advances in the technology around transportation such that um, you know, uh, ego drives is just going to get better, we're going to get more efficient, we're going to get, uh, and there's a ton of AI that is you know, part of that, an awful lot of um, really interesting algorithms that are um, at play helping us understand how um, we can improve vehicles so as to drive more efficiently. Right, so I mentioned safety, I mentioned efficiency, um, for sure, uh, uh, and, uh, this notion of convenience, right? I mean, just this idea that uh, as we get into AI, all the things that we were just talking to as a committee, the, the notion that uh, um, you can now drive a vehicle if you're impaired, you can now drive a vehicle if you're, you know, whatever the thing is, that you can now get into your vehicle and it will drive for you. Um, it, once we get to levels of autonomy that, that um, take over certain things that we simply as humans are not good at doing, um, staying aware, in that fifth hour of your driving, this is where long haul, I mean, we already have long haul trucking, that's already sorted out. And many of the vehicles on the port, you'll see over the next 10 years, I would suggest that many of the vehicles will be, uh, um, trucks will be um, autonomous. Now, what they're not doing is the first mile or the last mile. What they're doing is the long haul part. So you have to figure out how to get onto the interstate yourself. And when you get to New York City and you have to drive through traffic and figure out, that's not going to be an autonomous solution, but the autonomous solution is the, the 8 or 10 or 15 hours of driving on a fairly well-defined piece of road. Um, the, the firm that's doing that right now, and I can give you the name, uh, they've not only said they're not handling the first and last mile, they've also said, we're just telling you which roads we'll, we'll do this on and which roads we won't. We're not going to worry about snow. We're not going to worry about you know heavy rain. We're not going to worry about all these things. We're just going to focus. They're you know, trying out in Miami, and they realize Boy, it gets really heavy rain sometimes, and we just can't operate in those conditions. So they've kind of cut all of that off. And so they're defining, this is sort of a little bit of the geofence type of thing, but they're saying what roads we will work on and what problem we're trying to solve. And within that, 
um, we have a fairly high level of confidence that um, all the AI um, functionality that breathes uh, life into an autonomous vehicle will work. Um, I mentioned uh, this, this sort of um, advanced sensors, I, I, the, 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 and, and you've already heard about um, the computational idea, the sort of quantum computing idea. That <coughs> You know, we'll get beyond a state where it's a zero one computer, but it has both states at the same time, and that will open up a whole new level, we imagine, of computing power. But my answer to the question is, uh, um, is computing constraining what we can do now? I think the answer is it always has and probably always will. And, and, and I, I, I submit that just simply because we're always going to be pushing the envelope on, on the amount of data that we access and the amount of way we pull, you know, the methods we have for pulling it in and the algorithms we use for, you know, so we have deep learning now, which has a you know dimensionality that we didn't have before. Um, we can do that because computing power allows us that. We'll figure out something else to slow them down again. You know, we'll have another dimension. So is it is it a constraint now, like in, in the deployment of so automated? Vehicles? So that's a different question. Uh, um, uh, no, it's not. I mean, we have now the systems in place to run fully autonomous vehicles um, under the right conditions, right? The snow thing we haven't sorted out. The, the, all those other things we haven't sorted out. But um, under the right conditions, we have that. Um, I was before trying to answer the question, you know, are we past the fact that, you know, there's, you know, there's no uh, problem with computing power? And, and the reality is we will, you know, we're always going to have this. So you know, we have this big data issue right now, another term I don't like at all, which is because it's big until something bigger comes along, and now you're now you've got to redefine it. Um, but you know this notion that um, that every time you carry a cell phone around um, and you have GPS on, you're submitting where you are and what you're doing to some vendor who's storing all of that. Um, and at this point in time, um, your know, best guess is that we're storing about uh, 400 gigabytes of compressed data every month nationally. Um, and that's compressed. That's not data we can work with. That's um, you know we have to expand that to work with it. So it's a massive, massive amount of data, um, and uh, and it will just increase in size. And so, but there's a huge amount you can do with that data. Um, you know, we can get down to the point because you have what's called an Adam ID on each device that tells me exactly what device you have, and I can look at your traces over time, and I can line it with other data sets that we have at our disposal. I can see what your shopping patterns are. I can see where you live. For sure, I, can, I know where you live. Um, I know where you work. Uh, you know, I can see all these types of things. Uh, and it's neat, though. Well, I know that it's your ID, but for sure, I, because I know where you live, across. I probably can figure, you know, I can pretty much figure out, yeah. I mean, I can figure out the demographics of a family, the ages of the people in the family. Um, you know, there's a lot of, I mean, certainly I can get your shopping patterns from this. Um, and, and why am I I leave this at home, Mom. If you, that's right, you might from now on, actually, right? Um, I know already. But, 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 um, and, and then, of course, uh, then, then it looks like you, you, you didn't travel. Um, that's, that's a, a good way of doing it. But, but vehicles, right? Vehicles are all doing the exact same thing. So we talk about this as a, a, you know, a, a computing, I'm sorry, I'm holding the cell phone, um, but your vehicle's doing the exact same thing, right? It's saying where you're going. Your Tesla is reporting information on a regular basis as to how quickly it's going. You know, what speed are you, you know, um, how much gas are you using? Where, you know, do you get off at a stop? All these different things. How long did you wait? We have all this information now that every vehicle, so every vehicle is, is already outfitted with more lines of code than, you know, the space shuttle has, right? I mean, they're just, you know, they're just massively more complex as computer environments. And they're data environments. And so they're storing and, and reporting a huge amount of data on a regular basis. Um, all of this by way of saying, we're not anywhere near using that data in a way that we could. And that's the next, that's the next you know, step for us, is to begin to fuse all of these data sets together and to begin to draw more inferences about that. Um, and it'll just keep going. We'll store more data, we'll use more data. We talk about connected vehicles and the fact that where's that data going? Um, there's an infrastructure notion here Originally, when we talked about AI and, um, and a lot of automobiles, there was a thought that we would um, deploy infrastructure, smart infrastructure, that would say something to us about um, 
oh, you know, signals coming out, maybe you can even control the signal and tell it to turn you know, green for you at a certain time. Um, well, we moved a little bit away, and also the connected vehicle idea, that vehicles would talk to vehicles. We moved away from that recently and, um, and relied far more heavily on the onboard you know, capacity of, um, of, compu of uh, automobiles. And, and the reason for that is just primarily that it's so hugely expensive to deploy infrastructure. I mean, already we're not optimizing our signal designs. Just think about having to go out and tear every single thing out and put a whole new one in and have smart sensors throughout the, the road and all these different things. And it's just um, probably uh, um, more expensive than we'll ever be able to do. And so that was a shift in how we thought about um, the transportation system and put far more reliance on the automobile to do its work and far less on um, vehicle to vehicle or vehicle to infrastructure technology. So let me just um, make a couple of notes for things that you might want to think about with regards to, um, well, first of all, you should read the National Governors Association um, advice on, um, I gave you the link for that, on uh, um, the, the types of uh, policies or processes that you, you know, you should, you can think about that will help you in this regard. Very, very useful document, um, and that that'll be helpful. Um, I would also note that it's probably worth talking to some people in the Florida DOT who, I think, at this point are more. Um, this, I'm going to try to be careful not to say this in a positive way. They're, they have been more inviting to um, to AI and to autonomous and all those things than than other states. And they did it with this express purpose of um, trying to generate revenues and trying to be an early adopter. And, and, uh, you know, and so as such, one of your slides had the um, Florida AAB you know, Summit um, was from there. And uh, um, as such, the Florida AAB Summit is really the national summit. The, the, I mean, you know, there is a national summit, but pretty much people go to that every other year or every third year, because you go to Florida every year. So, um, they've really made a concerted effort to try to attract, um, uh, you know, um, autonomous vehicle vendors and um, and uh, um, and they are doing an awful lot with AI in general. Um, so um, maybe a couple, just a sort of a closing sort of comments, and then I'm, I'm, I'd love to, you know, hear your questions and talk about it. Um, I do think that that. AI and transportation is going to move in these sort of selective ways, right? It's going to start with um, what problems can we solve today? And, um, and those sort of, that last 10%, you know, we're going to figure that out over time. But I don't think you're, I mean, I, the, the sort of the, um, you almost never see a chart that says, here's where we get 100% adoption, because it's just so hard to know what that last 10% looks like. Um, I think the period of transition is going to be really the most difficult time, right? Um, and so, it, you know, now is the time to think about legislation, think about you know legislation, and think about the ways in which you, you manage and control this, because um, that that sort of vehicle mix between autonomous and non-autonomous is a really really tricky time for us, um, and it's going to be you know, difficult to sort out. Um, and then I think lastly, you know, agencies are are absolutely going to have to adapt whole systems, and this is sort of the thing that I think that structurally agencies have to, the DOTs is where I really what I'm referring to, I think DOTs are going to have to restructure themselves. I think they're going to have to think very differently about the problems they're trying to solve. The capacity has a whole new meaning in that system. I think safety, I and mean, all, you know, many of the DOTs are talking about and pushing these, you see, zero, you know, fatality, all these different things. Um, well, it's not really a DOT issue at that point. Um, you know, the auto manufacturers are solving that. It's a bit like the, the problem we had years ago with uh, uh, clean air, which was, you know, we had these standards that were pushing hard and the um, vehicle standards around clean air. Well, it turns out that um, all you need to do is um, buy the new vehicles and, um, and have a shift towards electric and problem solved on the transportation side. It's a shift that over to the energy side. <laughs> So, um, so I think uh, um, you know DOTs around the country are going to have to completely change the way they do planning, have to completely change the way they're structured, have to completely change the way that they develop policies and that they think about what the future and what the challenges are. I think you know, long-range planning doesn't make as much sense 
the 30 year kind of planning cycles don't make the same sense that they do now. Um, many, many interesting changes are going to occur. Just leave you with, I also think issues, I go to the <coughs> issues are now issues around data security, right? That's the big problem we have. And, and you know, you cast your, you know, cast around and saw DOTs throughout the country, and there are one or two data scientists who kind of know what they're doing. Um, and it's a huge, huge problem. Right? It's going to be the big problem of the future, and they're just not equipped to do that. So let me stop there. I took a lot of time, but I to field any questions. It's a big topic. What do you think the government should be doing? Federal or state? State. Should they be doing anything? Get, the, get, the, get it out of the way? No, I think for sure they should be doing something. I think that it's, uh, <clears throat> in fact, that's you know, sort of the, the latter comments were, were all around it. I think that um, at this point in time, the private sector is, drawn, is pushing full force. And, uh, and the shift, there's been a shift away from um, the, the, the public sector um, kind of owning the regulations and the private sector operating in a fairly constrained <laughs> way to one where the, 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 the private sector is just running rapid and doing things. So you get um, cities where you know, Burger comes in and just drops a thousand scooters on, <coughs> on the streets. And now you have to figure out they're, they're, where they run on the sidewalk, they run on the roads, you know, are they safe, where do they put, how do you move them from place to place? Are they legislated at all? You know, is there any cost structure? Are they paying for the infrastructure they're using or not? None of this is sorted out, and it just you know happened in a weekend. And, you know. Related question: With an aggressive private sector, one of the things they very clearly do <coughs> is say we need federal preemption, and we want you to have no say in this globally. And so, what's the what's the chances that it will go that way? We had one experience, as I recall, not a transportation, but of heavy vehicles, big sized trucks coming through, causing considerable more road stress than would occur from what we were willing to accept. Mm -hmm. We got preempted on that subject and had to take a measure uh, weight and size uh, vehicles coming through by a federal law. Uh, isn't this a ripe subject for exactly that? Yeah. I think it's absolutely. I think it is. And I, and, and I should say, I'm, what I'm suggesting is that uh, DOTs and agencies that don't spend energy and time thinking <coughs> in advance will find themselves you know, behind the curve. Uh, I'm, I'm, what I'm not suggesting necessarily, I think it's an open question, is that relationship between private and, and, and public. And um, I mean, We're working right now in Sunnyvale, Mass, and Audi is, um, has put several million dollars behind just um, investing in infrastructure. Um, new parking, new, um, you know, sort of smart parking. So I always coming in and paying to implement um, smart parking and um, with the effect that if you own an Audi, um, and it's all a test bed for them, it's not, it's not um, scaled to the country, but if you own an Audi, um, you can drive to your favorite restaurant, get out, and just tell it to go and park, and it'll go and park. Um, and the reason it works, in part, is because the, um, the, the, the AI on board and the autonomy of it um, you know, will facilitate a lot of it, but it's also supported by the fact that they're putting investment into the private infrastructure. So there, I mean, that, that, you, know, you couldn't get more of a sort of substantive shift in the um, private and public relationship there, um, where all of a sudden private companies are coming in and being willing to invest in infrastructure um, with no immediate return on investment. You know, you, you, you for sure we have P3s and all the different things where, um, you know, the well now you come in and you toll a road. Uh, you, you buy infrastructure and you toll a road or you have some relationship. All that's been existing for a long time. But this is different. This is coming in and paying to update infrastructure so as to um, facilitate their research and their design. Can you, can you describe smart parking more? Because you said you know you can get out and your car will go park itself, but I mean, does does that mean like it finds a public spot and then uses an app to pay the meter? Or does it mean there's like special lots that they own? Like how does smart parking work? It they in the case of sorry, look, what they've done is they've negotiated to um, add infrastructure, add, add electrical infrastructure to to certain um, just designated parking parking. So they built some parking in a in a very remote area. Um, and the idea was, right, you get out and it goes to that remote area and it just sits there until you need it. You call it, it comes back, or you call it a car and it comes back to you, of course. Um, 
And uh, so now you've got drop off pickup problems instead. So there's infrastructure issues around that. Um, which are less challenging than building a whole lot of parking. Which are less challenging than building a whole And now you're building parking in, in rural areas that are less expensive, yeah. that are, you know, the, and, 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 and you go to downtown, it can be more vibrant. Right. I mean, you know. So it would not be a good thing, I would think, if the effect of AI is massively increasing parking. Right. I don't think that's what the image is of the direction we're supposed to be going here. Maybe right, and that's maybe that's just my reaction. Well, I, and and uh, and I think that gets to to the questions that people have been asking about autonomous vehicles, which is there may be fewer ve autonomous vehicles, but more lane miles traveled, like right? you know more EMT. Um, yeah, maybe I'm even around. More. Right, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And then there's shared economy, which you know gets into this, which isn't an AI issue. I was trying to be careful not to. To, but that's it. You know, one, one thing I just want to know is that you know, there's certainly things like you know, when I started talking about self driving cars, you, you would say they're not like AI specific, right? But yeah, AI is really enabling them because we Absolutely. Have, so I mean, and that's kind of, you know, I, I was thinking about that as I was preparing to speak. It's like, what, what's our role as a task force? Is it to, we really are looking at those spin off implications and how we manage those, right? Not, because we're not, we're not talking about neural networks and how to control those. We're talking about how to deal with the consequences of, yeah. of this new technology. And I think you know, data is one of those edge cases that you have to consider. I, mean, I personally think that with the, um, with the advent of increased technology that, that is in existence, for which you know, some of which has AI and some of which may, may not, uh, there's going to be a massive flow of data. And um, and the uh, um, and the data is now uh, monetized in ways that it's never been before. I mean, uh, you know, you get these companies. You know, Google is making more off of data than anything else. They're selling data, um, and so uh, and so you get these companies that are actually, you know, why would Google be in the transportation space? Why is you know why are these companies stepping into transportation? Well, because of the data. It's not because of you know they're interested in having you know, facilitating movements around the, you know around Vermont or you know, Florida or California. It's because um, it's because with that technology comes data um, that can be monetized in a very substantive way, and that's what I think. Sorry, please. No, I was just going to reinforce is most of the drive for AI. If it's not for you know world peace, it's for advertising. Yes, that's exactly why they're doing. That's ex that's exactly right, and that's yep. Early now, but that you have to understand that motivation. You're exactly right. Yeah, and and so that you know that that I think, and I raise that because I think that's one of those places where if you're if you're a committee paying attention to AI, it does feel close enough to. Um, you know, to, to the charge of the committee to think about, okay, so that's going to mean a lot more data and data safety and data security. What are we going to do with it? Yeah. So I'd like to make a remark. I listened to your conversation and I think of the transportation problem that the state of Vermont has that there is no public transportation, there is no opportunity for people who live in the country to come into work without having their own car. And so I look at this as an opportunity to help people be able to move themselves around Vermont. That's going to be one of the benefits. That we see. You know, I'll, I'll, I'll oh, sorry, please. Another question that's all kind of related is, um, uh, particularly given the money center of what the development is like, is is it possible to be a leader in the state of transportation sector now? If you live in a relatively small rural state, um, we're not the place where. Uh, you can, uh, like Somerville, Mass, you can have uh, going to restaurants and having your cars park, or uh, or that's a big thing for you, which it clearly is. So there was some cameras or something like that. Uh, most of the things that seem to be uh, greatly advanced in the transportation side by artificial intelligence, particularly for the urban environments and not the rural ones. Is that fair? That is fair. Uh, I think that's true. Um, I think that uh, it's also, and, and, and for sure we're seeing a lot more money being invested in those areas. It makes sense why companies would invest money. There's more people and, and more money to be made there. Um, the problems in the rural areas uh, you know, are harder to solve. 
I'm, you know that like you you you, you, know, <laughs> you can't get from place A to place B easily to get a job or services or whatever. That's right. right. The way the rate is and, and the money isn't there. And the money isn't there. So so I mean, it's harder to to put that in place. And then you've got you know, to the extent that roads don't you know aren't going to be the weather or just the roads in general make it difficult to implement. Um, you know, so I think you're right. I, I'll just raise one. Um, one of the, the things we're finding ourselves doing around the country a lot is dealing with um, the very largest uh, um, public transit uh, providers. So, uh, um, you know, Metro and all these different, they're trying to determine, but their ridership is decreasing by you know, 15 or 20 percent year over year. Um, and it raises a really interesting question, especially in a state like Vermont, where um, we're putting a reasonable amount of money into our um, public transit. Um, and um, and if in fact it's losing ridership, um, you know, compared to like the Uber or so whatever it is at this point in time, um, should we continue to? What does it mean to continue to invest in? Not should we, but what does it mean to continue to invest in if in fact the private sector is coming in and supplanting some of that need? You know, where how do you balance that out? Um, what, what does end up happening is. There, there are for sure some people who you know, don't own a smartphone and don't have a bank account and don't have, and these people, you don't want them left without options. Um, but it changes the calculation from a public sector standpoint as to how you think about you know, public good and investing in these and, and you know, ensuring the public good. Uh, Steve, yeah. uh, I, I think it's, it's time for, uh, do, we, do we now we transition to uh, our next sure. presenter? I just want to say thank you. Yeah, you bet. Very much. Um, yeah. Yeah, if you guys just go on this and want to talk some more, or want to hear more, I'm happy to provide something. So, um, good. We'll, we'll be talking about aviation, so if that's if you're more than willing to uh, comment. Um, our next presenter is Guy. Um, I guess maybe, maybe could you give a brief introduction? Sure. Um, I know you mentioned you want to talk about a couple things. Um, uh, one, and again, one of the main things we're, we want to we want to hear from you is. What do you think the current status of AI is in aviation? What do you think the future uses or implications are? Pros, cons, and then maybe what do you think the government should be doing? Perfect. Well, thanks for first of all for having me. Um, I, I do want to throw a quick shout out to Milo. I think uh, you're an amazing speaker. I think uh, you carry a lot of credit for your school. So I think uh, you know, I wanted to just say that if anybody didn't recognize that, I'd be like, hey, we hire you right away. So if you need a job, <laughs> after, let us know. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, great job. Um, yeah, I thought I'd talk today about uh, aviation in general. And uh, in Vermont and nationwide, I think it's important to, and I'm just going to talk about seven key elements. I'm going to just talk high level bullets and then, you know, and then open it up for what I think should be policy considerations. Uh, and Joe is uh, cringing right now. <laughs> <I'm just saying. laughs> so, so yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah, <laughs> take one, right? So, you know, I think it's important for us to understand what in the industry and what governmental initiatives are currently underway right now. I just want to briefly talk about that. Some high-level things. We also want to talk about current restrictions right now on uh, aviation as it relates to autonomy and autonomous operations. We'll touch on that for a few minutes. Technology in play. I think it's important to know what currently is out there, and uh, again, once again, at a high level. But then also, you know, what is coming very soon. There are a lot of uh, vendors that are in a race to develop aeronautical vehicles that you can just walk up to, swipe a credit card, and it'll take you from point A to point B. And it's currently in the mix. Uh, I'm going to transition from there to regulatory issues, not only at a federal level, but also at a local level and the state level. There are some reg there's some regulations in the state of Vermont right now that should be considered, which will segue into um, policy considerations. But I, I also want to just throw the one part of it, which is kind of, uh, kind of an oxymoron, I guess. We're talking about artificial intelligence. I want to talk about the personal perception of human beings as it relates to do we want to actually hop into a unpersoned aeronautical vehicle. So uh, I think that's important to talk about. So the uh, FAA years ago actually had the forethought uh, of this industry. Uh, right now and then by 2020, it's been going on now for 15 years, they have a, a, a program called ADSB. It's Automated Dependent Broadcast. And that surveillance broadcast is going to enable the national airspace system to take what's called the five-mile separation issue, which is a congestion issue in the sky, 
when airplanes are flying into or air route from one uh, from California to New York, or they're getting ready to be sequenced to land at an airport, there is a five-mile separation requirement right now because of pilot error, controller error, error uh, meteorological scenarios. So. ADSB and what's called next gen with FAA is the sequencing of those aircraft by utilization of AI. Now we're able to take uh, ground-based radar systems, which is very clunky and expensive to operate, and they're going to remove those systems. And now the ADSB, the aircraft, will talk to one another. That's ongoing right now, and they're testing it. Uh, a lot of colleges in uh, Texas uh, and uh, Alaska are utilizing this system, and they're able to tighten that five mile, imagine on the highway it's a distance that's, that's uh, acceptable for the aircraft, I'm sorry, for vehicles on the ground, now in the air we're able to crunch in those five miles and sequence aircraft and be able to decongest the airspace. So that's currently in, in, in play. How long does it take an airplane to travel five miles? Well, so a small aircraft flies about two miles a minute, so that's about two and a half minutes. So five miles for a large aircraft, their approach speeds are 160 miles an hour, which is about two and a half to three miles a minute. So it doesn't take long, it's about a minute and a half separation. So uh, um, factor in some pilot error and some ground speed variations. Uh, it, it, it's, it's pretty, but now we're able to tighten them up. But what happens if like a, uh, you lose contact with one airplane, the one between the two that are <laughs> traveling at two and a half miles? Correct. We're gonna, well, we're going to talk about, this is, well, I'm going to talk about that in a minute where, because there are aircraft right now that are operating under category three, as Joe had described them. They are operating right now. They've been operating that way for years and years. Now, where do we get to the next level? We'll talk about that in a minute. Yeah. Thank you. That's a good question. From an industry level, again, high level stuff, because we've got 25 minutes and I know I'm standing between you guys on a break. So, uh, so Uber Elevate is one example of uh, transferring uh, human beings. And, you know, we'll talk about infrastructure in a minute, but the theory is you just go to a location that's already been pre-approved, it's already got the infrastructure in place, which is uh, power, it's fuel perhaps with hybrid aircraft, uh, it's a pilot perhaps um, if, uh, for in the time being, uh, and then it's the, the actual airspace clearance and getting this thing so you can uh, lift people. That's for personnel. I know the AFL-CIO is here, I know the Teamsters are probably very interested in ground cargo, uh, and uh, what's, what's interesting is obviously with today's regulatory environment with FAA, uh, they're not going to allow for the drone delivery, but they're testing it up, in, up in, you know, in Canada and other states where you're able to take parts and pieces, maybe a pizza, and deliver it. Uh, but there's those limitations, which we'll talk about briefly. Um, you know, other industry course uses, everybody knows that drones are being used for just uh, design level survey. You know, you can do survey, you can do before and after construction photos and look at uh, other things like infrastructure inspections, like bridges and roadways and things of that nature. Interestingly, uh, there are uh, companies working with VTrans right now that are going to be looking at, and in other states, load factors on railroad just by use of drones. So it's really interesting. Some restrictions on uh, the name SUAS, the simple first uh, uh, letter is S, uh, which means small, small unmanned aeronautical or aeronautical systems. Uh, small is related to how much weight there are. 55 pounds is the limitation. Uh, they're limited without a waiver to daytime only operations, and they also have limitations of ground controlled line of sight. So the average eyeball, define the average eyeball, right? And uh, so whether you have hyperopia or myopia, the distance and visual acuity to be able to spot a little tiny thing about this big at two miles away is nearly impossible. So the physical limitations of the, uh, of the drone and the ground line of sight is number one, the, uh, the issue with um, autonomous vehicles because right now they have to be controlled. Um, there, there are uh, tests that have been done, just launch them and see how far they go before they disconnect and it's miles. So, uh, but it's illegal. So right now, in the regulatory standpoint, that's where they're at. The technology in play, really, uh, I was going to bring in, I didn't, is the quadcopter, the Phantom DJI 4, three small little quadcopter. It's about this big. It weighs, uh, you know, probably about four or five pounds. Ironically, that technology is now creeping into the industry, and they are test flying right now adult size, human size quadcopters, where the person is able to just lift the, the aircraft off the ground. They're testing them, and uh, the quadcopter is uh, was primarily started with. Was so good for them. They should have, they did patent it, but they probably should have said the quadcopter sold solely as part of our patent, but they didn't. Um, 
The, uh, the other designs that are uh, ongoing right now for the larger size really is uh, in, in the 90s to two, in 2000s, uh, and now I'm going to start getting into regulatory now. The, the, in the 90s and 2000s, there was a big rush for what's called very light jets. So you think about infrastructure for a second. Runways are too, shut, too, too uh, short. And in lieu of spending millions of dollars of, of building more infrastructure and land acquisition and permitting and environmental impacts, why not just uh, certificate smaller aircraft that can still carry four or five bodies and go from point A to point B and under, you know, go a thousand miles in under an hour and a half and, and be able to put them on these small runways. Unfortunately, in the regulatory process in, in the United States to certificate those aircraft, 15 models entered and only two really were the product, and it was the Honda jet and the Cessna jet. So not a lot of very light jets were generated. They tried it, now we're back to let's extend runways, okay? So, uh, which is very expensive and time, and it takes time. So they've, um, the industry right now is, is now looking at, Uber's looking at, and others are looking at the, the VTOL, the vertical takeoff and landing technology, which is what the drones, a lot of the drones are using right now, but now as humans rather than just a camera or, a, or an infrared or a LIDAR system. Um, some, some companies that are out there are doing anything from completely battery driven, which when they take off and land from the top of a building, well now you gotta get phase three power to the top of this building, maybe it wasn't in the original design, the site's great, but we can't get power to the top of the building, that's a siting issue. Uh, so others are not only doing the batteries, but they're also doing hybrids, so there's fuel and, um, and battery driven as well. Range for these things, 200 miles, can carry a couple of bodies, and, um, and for now, uh, they haven't even launched them in the U.S. because of regulatory issues. Um, you know, you're, you're looking at, uh, um, you know, the, the, the quadcopter, two people, 200 mile range. Pretty, yeah, pretty nice. Sure, absolutely. Texting me, we're on Skype saying, Can you can you ask them? Are they log? If, if they can listen in on the phone, and there's a call in number that was part of the invitation, so okay. they can call that. Thank you. Thanks. Should I continue? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So uh, you know, interestingly, the battery. Um, uh, did you have a question, sir? No, no. All right, I was going to say, if, you, if this was an auction, you just bought a Porsche. <laughs> yeah. no, <but> anyway. <laughs> so battery-powered quadcopters are really interesting. The misconceptions that are out there is battery-powered aircraft are a lot less noisy than, than uh, you know, reciprocating or turbine-powered aircraft. Although there are slight decibel levels different differences, the actual noise from aircraft are pr predominantly come from the propellers and the fact that they're almost at the speed of sound out of the wingtip or the rotor blade. So, so. Um, that's a misconception. Other misconceptions is that if you have an Uber, uh, there are many times, I've been in New York City, we call an Uber because it's raining like crazy that folks are going to be able to go and that the, the quadcopter is going to be able to fly in all weather. Helicopters don't like ice and, uh, and it's just those are some limitations that folks will have to consider. I bring up noise because I'm going to bring it, I'm going to come back to regulatory concerns in Vermont in just a moment. Some regulatory issues, just uh, briefly, and then we'll uh, and then we'll go into uh, the personal perception. Then we'll, we'll go for questions. Um, so the FAA right now, currently, does not have any regulation for this at all. In fact, it took close to ten years to go from what was called a very special section of the Federal Registry called Section 333 that allowed people to go out and and uh, to get a permit. And, a, and then a, an actual certificate to operate a drone in the national airspace system, limitations below 400 feet, daytime <laughs> only, and line of sight. Recently, in the past year and a half, they then certificated, they finally wrote a part of the National Registry called Part 107. And so if you're 16 years old, you could be a 107 pilot today, and you could just take the test, and then you can commercially, for real estate agencies and, and the like, go out and do these things. But there's no, right now, there's no regulation for, uh, for these unmanned aeronautical vehicles that are gonna be carrying passengers and perhaps cargo. So that's gonna have to be a rewrite at the federal level, and then we'll, we'll talk about state in just a moment. The design and certification of aircraft, we've kind of talked about, but the, a large issue right now, which I think should be something that this committee, if they're looking at Uber flying, is that there is a huge pilot shortage, and there's a huge uh, uh, mechanic shortage. 
Now, for pilots, some are going to argue this is, these are supposed to be pilotless, so it's not necessarily an issue. However, uh, it's the same for mechanics, and there are schools in the state that are established already, but um, I, would, I would think that Vermont colleges, perhaps Jeff Spaulding would want to consider uh, going in and looking at his curriculum across the state colleges to look at what is the, what is the uh, current uh, training that we have in all of our degree programs across the state and should we entertain uh, focusing on AI. The uh, battery, uh, well, let me just drive on, the local uh, state, Title V, which is Vermont Air, Vermont uh, Transportation, Title V gives very specific law on how to certificate very small landing areas. And you had mentioned earlier some of the urban uh, um, underprivileged can't get from one place into the, uh, you know, uh, into uh, the towns. And um, the state does have a certification process in place for what's called a restricted landing area. And uh, so, uh, you know, when, when this uh, is looked at, uh, more at a, a personnel and moving cargo perspective, they should consider, and I would caution, not really changing that law much because the process is in place to restrict that even further. It already has that first word is restricted. <laughs> so uh, to further restrict that may in the future, if this does take off, no pun intended, um, to um, uh, maybe a little <laughs> but uh, it's going to be a, a problem to uh, then try to certificate maybe an urban takeoff and landing area, transport people back and forth. I know public transit has buses, but if this does actually uh, become a wave of the future per se, then they're going to have to consider that. Lastly, I talk about personal perception. Uh, you know, years ago, the, se the Boeing 747 required four crew member and 17 personnel in the back of the airplane to crew the aircraft years ago. They then went down to, through automation, went down to now two people in the cockpit. Uh, with the fuel management systems that are up to speed, the navigators with all the current uh, artificial intelligence and, and navigational equipment. The, so the perception used to be, when you look in the cockpit, if you don't see four bodies, people got nervous. Now it's down to two. Wiggins Airways in Vermont that carries a million and a half pounds of cargo to Burlington, uh, I'm sorry, uh, to Rutland and Montpelier airports. Burlington is much more million, uh, more pounds of, uh, of cargo every year. They have a, an aircraft that they've reduced down to a single pilot operation for two reasons. One for payroll, and the other is less than two pilots in the, in the cockpit. You don't need a cockpit voice recorder, so uh, so they don't have Big Brother watching anymore. <laughs> so. Um, you know, the, the perception over, over the years has been that, you know, these aircraft need to be personed, and uh, they're getting to the point where they can be, um, you know, reduced uh, down to, at a minimum, one in play now, and even further in the future, uh, it could be pilotless. The FAA currently has approved Category 3 uh, aircraft. Uh, there are aircraft that at 800 feet, you click a button, it flies the entire route and it'll come down, it'll land the aircraft, reduce the throttles, decelerate the airplane, taxi it to parking, and stop the aircraft. That's currently in play right now. Um, so, but there are pilots that are still sitting in the cockpit to grab the controls if there's an issue. It's by use of, they use radar altimeters, they use GPSs, they use the autopilots, and they're introducing LIDAR as well into uh, aircraft rather than very clunky and, and frankly, um, uh, sterilizing uh, radar systems. So those are, those are going away. So, um, uh, but the technology is in play right now. Uh, let me finish up with policy considerations. I kind of touched on them. I planted some seeds along the way. One of which is, again, I think this is a, uh, this is a Vermont, this is kind of an ACCD, it's kind of a VTRANS, it's kind of a Department of Labor, Department of Education issue in that I think Mr. Spaulding should be spoken with, uh, uh, you know, and have a conversation about how we have to think about education. I think it's very important. If it's not in the curriculums right now, I think it should be considered. And I don't know, and I, I don't want to speak for them, but it's just something to think about. There's, a, I mentioned it before, there's a significant shortfall in mechanics, aircraft mechanics, and pilots, and there's also a significant um, lack of, uh, of avionics, which is the AI component. Avionics are all the radios and inter interoperability with ground stations and satellites. Those items need to be trained a lot more, and there's a shortfall. It's documented, and folks will tell you that. Focus on aviation education as well needs to be, uh, uh, I think, should be a priority consideration uh, for the state. 
Um, with these pilot shortages, uh, it's, it's difficult. There's one aviation program, VTC has it. It's a four-year bachelor's degree in aeronautics. And we're looking at right now, um, you know, increasing the AI component already. We're thinking ahead. Airspace I talked about, another policy consideration, Title V outlines restricted landing areas. I would caution any changes to that restricted, because the word restricted is already there, uh, landing areas so that we don't, uh, you know, reverse 70 years of a good policy. So it's something to think about. Last thing I'll say is this, is uh, noise jurisdiction. Uh, I, I was so glad to hear you say the word federal preemption. Noise is federally preempted with aircraft, period. Um, it's been argued at the highest courts. It's been argued in Vermont. In fact, uh, uh, the district down in Middlebury, I, I, we argued it with, uh, when I was the aeronautics administrator, we argued and they said that they agreed with the Middle, Middlebury runway extension. There were a lot of people who were concerned about noise around their airports. And we argued the point, and they agreed, and their opinion was that noise is federally preempted. So I say that because right now it's not standardized around the state. There are different districts under the Agency of Natural, I'm sorry, under Act 50, who would argue uh, different points on that case. So if we're going to use aviation point-to-point -point flights, we need to think about uh, these things when they have policy considerations come in uh, for no, I tightening up on noise. Um, so, with that, I think I did all right. Question for you. Yes, sir. You touched on workforce um, and uh, not having enough uh, folks, you know, mechanics and other some of the other things you mentioned. What's the overall trend if you take out commercial flights like the Delta and Air, you know, United of air traffic in Vermont? Is that on the rise? Is it on the decline? Has it State level? Uh, well, I think it's a byproduct of, of, uh, of how the airports choose to operate, the leadership of the airport. If the airport itself chooses to have a very verbose or a very strong aviation program and public awareness program, fly ins, things of that nature, I think the airport, uh, it'll be on an upward trend. Um, and when I was the aeronautics administrator, I, that was something that we pushed. We pushed to every airport, that was the goal, one event per quarter. Per year, so it's four events a year, and there's 10 airports. That's 40 events. A lot of flying, a lot of aviation education, a lot of fuel being sold, a lot of maintenance, and it just really uh, impacted uh, the economy. But it also it also increased the amount of activity uh, for the general aviation side of the house. So general aviation really it does flow with uh, it does flow with leadership. I may not have answered your question directly. I, I haven't been, I'm not in tune with it right now, but I do know that ACCD is currently working on a um, kind of a economic development. Uh, there was a bill that was passed last year, and I believe they're working on that. They had a meeting last week, I heard, and um, so that's important. That's a good question. I don't, I don't have the number. I have a question that generates out of an event of a few weeks ago, but I really <coughs> not precisely have the details right. Uh, but it was essentially like this, as I recall. Um, a new commercial airplane, now we're on the commercial side, a regular uh, uh, air traffic company, uh, uh, picks up a new uh, plane. This is somewhere Sri Lanka, Indonesia, something like that. Um, and uh, it's flown two times. The first time, it's flown by a pilot who realizes, uh, or there's a pilot in the seat, whether he's supposed to do the takeoff, I'm not sure, or when he comes in, but he realizes that the automatic uh, system that is controlling the takeoff has a flaw. It's telling him something that can't be true. That is, it's telling him something's still happening, but the plane is heading for the ocean. Um, and uh, he knows to turn it off, he turns it off, he goes away does the flight comes back, uh, doesn't tell anybody, which is the story. New pilot gets on, um, sees that the autom same situation, the automatic system uh, and the plane is going down, corrects the information getting from the automated system. The automated system then recorrects it back. And after a period of back and forth of this, it goes in the ocean killing out all of the do I have basically the story right? Is that you do? <laughs> you do. Yeah. Okay. 
Uh, it struck me that that was one that was one of the stories about the risk of where we stand in terms of automated transportation. That is control uh, uh, without uh, uh, proper human um, involvement or interaction or what, how the signals. Uh, what is the lesson for that from the industry? This is this is a particularly bad example of something that ought to scare a lot of people who fly. Um, what is the lesson from that in terms of uh, uh, automation and the running of uh, aircraft? Well, I would say that every every law that's on the books with aviation was written in blood. And um, on, uh, the NTSB's sole uh, mission is to, uh, uh, to fully investigate incidents, make recommendations, and in fact enforce, uh, and from time, the FAA will enforce those laws when the recommendations come down. I know when they look at that, there will be a, a bunch of regulations that will come down and, Unfortunately, there was loss of life, as is, I'm sure with cars. There's going to be loss of life with, with cars as well. So I, I don't know. I'm not exactly an expert in that area. But I would say that I know that they'll, they'll look at it, they'll make the changes, and, and perhaps there are times where they say this particular type of autopilot is no longer until you can you know, test it a little bit more. In this case, I think it was a sensor malfunction that, that, that sure. basically was telling the plane that it was doing something different than it was. Right. I don't but know if it's it's what's most interesting about it is one pilot knows he can turn it off, right? Yeah. Which is gets back to this level, to level three four, drive. Right, right. Yeah. exactly. Yeah. Uh, 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 when it goes back to human in, uh, control, will that occur? Whereas the second pilot, he keeps trying to use the technology as it's given and ends up in the ocean. And okay. I think it's kind of like the guy that's drunk in the Tesla, falling asleep and driving, because he maybe trusted the car that's going to do the mm -hmm. right thing, maybe? But, was the car was never, it was never meant to be driven yeah. totally autonomously, right? So. so I want to get back to the... Could, could this be the last question to go into the break? <laughs> well, that would be... I just, so no yeah, make, it a, make it a five-part question. <laughs> yeah, well, I may. So I want to get back to the recorder box that you were talking about earlier. Now, that strikes me as that's for safety. So the idea that someone would not have two pilots sure. in a plane so that they could override a safety mechanism is not heartwarming to me. Yeah, it's not necessarily overriding it. It's just basically the law is the law. And one of the considerations that were taken when they go down to a single pilot operation is that happens to be one of them. It's one of the byproducts of going down to a single pilot operation. They streamline the autonomy in the aircraft so that they can fly with just one aircraft. But a byproduct of that is that you no longer, the way the laws written, it require a cockpit voice recorder. Can I ask just one question? I mean, I think this idea, so we focused on this plane crash because of the confusion, and there's been definitely some crashes and some fatalities with automated vehicles. And so we tend to focus on those, you know, they're kind of highlighted. But overall, like in the aviation, has the automation saved lives? You know? Is there any way, I guess it's hard to yeah. know because you're, it's avoided no. loss. But well, I mean, it's what it's done in, with certain aircraft is, uh, is and I'll give you, well, I won't give is you. Is it safe for overall? Well, it is safe, absolutely. Right. It is safe for overall. <laughs> but you go back into the human factors where an individual yeah. will put themselves, because they rely on all that automation, they say, I'm going to put this aircraft into a place that I really shouldn't be in, but I got a parachute I can pull, or I can, I can throw the autopilot on. And they, and that's, so that's a human factor. It's not necessarily an AI issue. Yeah. Uh, Good. All right. Well, Guy, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, everybody's been sitting a couple hours. Instead of, uh, it was 10 minutes for a break. Can, it, can we reduce that to maybe five minutes? So we can start to get back on sure. schedule. Sure. Okay. Thereabouts. <laughs> Any final words? Uh, go for it. Um, go for it. We're looking for, uh, are you going to be presenting? Yeah. Okay. Oh, that's awesome. um, yes. What I, you know, I think what we I mentioned the guy, Maybe give us a little introduction by yourself um, and you know, talk about any subjects you'd like. And, okay. Uh, we're really looking, our mandate from the uh, legislature is we want to know what the current state of AI is, future future uses, pros and cons, and you know, what the government can do to help out, okay. if anything. Okay, thanks. All right, so my name is Igor Sosky. I'm a, I'm a CTO of the at Vera Semi, this is a recent spin-off of the Global Foundries Group. Um, this was originally IBM Microelectronics. 
moved under Global Foundries uh, when they purchased that group, and then now it's moving on uh, away from Global Foundries into a separate company called the Verisemi. It's about 850 uh, people group. Um, the majority of them are in Vermont. Um, and what we do is what is called applications uh, specific integrated circuits. These are ASICs, custom chips for specific applications. Now, typically the team has been playing for the last 25 years. So this is a group uh, of folks that have been designing chips for 25 years. Uh, they're really experienced. Um, we have been working in the, typically in the wired and wireless space. So these are telecoms like Cisco, Huawei, things like that. Um, there's a strong push now to go into uh, the computer chips that are custom for artificial intelligence. Um, we've already uh, uh, taped out and are in production with some of them in, uh, in our previous nodes. Uh, we're currently working on the next generation of artificial intelligence chips. So this is the hardware that's at the, at the root of, of, of all this acceleration. Um, so uh, what I'm going to do today is I'm going to give you just uh, my view on the AI trajectory. How does the AI hardware kind of work in this whole scheme of things? Uh, what are some of the trends, the hardware trends? Uh, comparison between natural artificial intelligence, at least my view of it. And then I have two slides on benefits and challenges that I see um, with this technology. So. All right, so let's kick off with just a, um, a slide uh, on artificial intelligence today. So this is not a technology that's kind of enabling something in the future. This is really with us right now. We have IBM Watson um, that can beat humans in jeopardy. Uh, we have uh, Facebook implementing face recognition to actually connect friends. Amazon Echo Dots that are in our house that you can ask them anything and they'll get you the answer from the internet. Um, Self-correction, when you type your emails or you're searching something. Um, we have uh, now machines that can beat humans even in games like AlphaGo, which are incredibly complex. It, it would be impossible for a software programmer to code uh, a set of rules to actually um, beat somebody at Go at this point. So this is all artificial intelligence. Um, as we move forward, um, what we see is, is a, a trajectory that's, that's, that's controversial in, in many ways, um, but it is something that's at this point uh, uh, considered uh, the average prediction of where we move from specific AI, which is something like image recognition or driving a car or <coughs> doing voice recognition or translation, to something like a general AI, or what we call a singularity. That's basically where we have a machine that's so uh, intelligent that basically supersedes all humans uh, from that aspect, and it moves beyond that. Um, so what I have on this slide is, um, uh, is a set of predictions that were made in the 1990s by uh, a fellow called Ray Kurzweil. He's a, he's a director at Google on artificial intelligence, working on artificial intelligence. So he made these predictions in the 1990s, and so far he's batting about 83% accuracy with where we sit right now. So you can take that um, um, the way you want it, but it, it seems that most of, his, most of his predictions are coming through. So by 2019, um, we're looking at wearable electronics. Uh, we already have smart watches. Uh, we are looking at self-driving cars. Yeah, you can argue whether we're level three, four, or five, but we're moving in that direction quickly. Um, we have um, autonomous, uh, um, do we have assistants, like an AI assistant, like Siri and Cortana and Alexa. Uh, we can translate uh, uh, <coughs> even now. So um, 2019 looks like a likely predictions to happen. Uh, 10 years from now, um, we're looking, we're moving with the hardware acceleration of Moore's Law. So what the predictions there are that a thousand dollar computer buys you something that's a thousand times more powerful than the human brain from the actual processing power. Um, we have computers that are actually generating their own knowledge. So you actually uh, give them a specific science project and the computer is actually chasing that piece and trying to discover new ideas and so on. Um, we have mapped the human brain sufficiently that we can actually start moving peripheral devices like headphones, VR glasses, direct, directly implanted into our, 
into our brains. Uh, now this is scary to me and I'm pretty sure many other people, but uh, this is something that people view as a, as a potential machine-human integration that kind of helps us uh, not supersede, not to get superseded by machines, but incorporated into them. So anyways, that's a scary thought for me, but um, when you move forward to the middle of the next century, you see, or the century actually, you see the singularity. This is where machines um, uh, are basically uh, more intelligent than all the humans on the earth combined. Uh, they're creative uh, and they're really effectively something that's more uh, powerful in any way than humans are. So these are predictions. Um, uh, they are, um, so far, they seem to be accurate, but I don't know how they move forward as, as we move forward. But it is a pretty steep trajectory. We're talking 25 years to where um, the top 100 scientists thinks that we're going to have uh, general in intelligence, 50-50 chance that we're going to have that general intelligence. Okay, so um, let me show you how the hardware works behind this. Uh, this is, uh, I think there was a really good presentation Milo gave this morning. Um, this is an example of image recognition. Uh, this is an example, again, of one type of artificial net. Um, the way it works is you kind of, this is an image recognition, so you feed an image on the left side here. Um, the little image is broken down into pixels. The pixels are provided to each of these nodes. So these are neurons. It's very much bio-inspired. It's kind of like the human brain. And what you have, these neurons are then connected to the next layer of neurons with the edges that have weights on them. And the weights are where the, the teaching and the programming happens. And what the weights are is you basically say that I'm going to take the value of this neuron, multiply it by a number that's associated with that weight, and then add all these other neurons that feed into the next generation neuron and generate a new number. And then you do that again and again and again. And on one side you provide an image, on the other you have a classification of that image. In this case it's a Volvo uh, a car, so you can actually have the, um, the image recognize this. And uh, as Milo mentioned, there's a backprop where you actually reevaluate these images while you train. But once you, you're deployed in the field, you have this, this system that quickly classified it. Um, now, what you see here is that there's a lot of nodes, a lot of multiplication. Does, does the training continue? I mean, so you get to a certain point in the training, so it's ready to be deployed, whatever it is. Yeah. But then, does it, as it's actually deployed, does it continue to train and learn? So if you look at something like a, like a self-driving car, that would be very dangerous to do that. But I agree with John and Milo that if you have like a Siri uh, on your phone and wants to recognize your accent, uh, or it wants to look at your behavior, yeah, you might be able to continue to train. But typically when, for example, Tesla does their software update, the car is no longer doing any learning. The car is just implemented and what it might do is collect data and send it back to Tesla so Tesla can learn on that data and deploy the next software update, but it will not train. And in general, there's actually a difference between the training devices and inference devices. The inference devices are massive computer chips that are basically bursting at the edges right now. They're as big as we can build them. Um, the inference devices that are deployed inside the cars are much smaller devices. They're much cheaper, much more uh, efficient. But the capability to do that, yes. It's possible. Exists. So last time, I know it was environmental sensors. We deploy these environmental sensors on the landscape and collect information, train them, and then use them to make predictions. But because it's not dangerous, we continue training on the new information that's coming in. It's, it's the reason they don't do it with yep. cars is simply because that wouldn't be dangerous. Yep. I just, I, I just wonder if it's dangerous though. As long as the, you have sort of this base level operating, it's just like human. We learn while we're out there and prove it. But anyway, I don't mean to run. <laughs> yeah. You can fool the sensors, and you can yeah. fool the sensors, and then you teach something that's wrong. Imagine somebody giving you blurry glasses and then telling you to learn something about a system. You might learn something very differently that you don't want to use. Yeah. 
Um, so this is really, if you can see the layers, the first set of layers, the text edges, the next set of layers, the text features, the next set of layers, the text even bigger features, and then you classify the, the object. So that is a, yeah, go ahead. So the, the, the thing this feeds on, if anything you want to, you know, it is, it's food, is all these images. Uh, so it's all, a, this system analyzes uh, what is mass amount of data? If we look at it as human beings, everything we're looking around the room, right here, all of this thing. Uh, so, how far are we away from the collection of the data to make this equivalent to everything that I can see and recognize, or any of that? Yeah. Uh, uh, are we close? So, like facial recognition, I assume facial recognition I now understand is very quite accurate, but you're going to have the faces to recognize. Where are we in that data collection? Yeah, yeah. So, so typically what this comes with is um, labeled data sets, they're called. So what you do is you show this picture to the, train, to the, to the uh, system, and you say, that's a Volvo. Remember that. But then this Volvo might be looked at from a different angle and stuff. And the, the system effectively tunes the way a toddler would learn to walk or to recognize pictures. A toddler, you show a duck different ducks, but then the toddler eventually knows every possible duck in, in the world. It doesn't have to be that exact angle, doesn't have to be that exact lightning, lighting to actually recognize that duck. All right, let me go back to facial recognition. Yeah. My face doesn't look like it did, uh, unfortunately, at a younger age. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> and if I go back to all the way to the, to the moment I was born, what I look like and what I look like today, how does that, how do you deal with that in terms of uh, the recognition <coughs> capability to recognize that, that the picture of me as an infant is me as an adult? You know? Yeah, so typically there's, there's some parts of the face, like the, the relationship between, the separation between the eyes, the, the length of the nose, the mouth. So those things, the ratios are somewhat maintained, but that doesn't mean that this, this uh, system is going to be better at recognizing the, a baby picture to somebody that's old. You might have a still the same mistakes, but if it sees you from different angles, whether you're smiling or frowning, I think it will recognize that that is your face. It will recognize you, and you can see that already on your phones. Uh, I don't know if you have an iPhone or anything like that, they already classify images of you at different lightning, with a hat, without a hat, wearing different clothes. It will still do that for you. Yeah. So it's kind of think the way I look at artificial intelligence is. In normal world software programming, somebody writes a recipe of how to recognize something. So I would say if it has, a, if it has these features, those, these features, this is what the person looks like. If I look at artificial intelligence, I just give them loads of data and label the data, and the program writes itself. So it's almost like a self-written software. It's not a coder writing the rules of the program, it's the machine writing its own rules to satisfy that this image gives you that label. And you bombard it with thousands and thousands of images and thousands and thousands of labels. And then you show an image that the, the computer has never seen before and it still labels it correctly. But to get back to your question of recognizing you at different ages, so we have a class where students will do this and if you train an algorithm to distinguish between a car and a cat and a human, you can do that. But if you really wanted it to get good at distinguishing between different cats, you would train it on a more. different set and more images of those cats. So you could, I mean, I was actually thinking that would be a great class project. Well, you had enough images I mean, of I'll you you some different ages, <laughs> it could get good at recognizing you at different ages or yeah. someone else at different ages. And that, that is the biggest yeah. leap in artificial intelligence. A lot of the algorithms have been with us since the 70s and earlier than that. The one leap is, one is the hardware enablement. We have the hardware that actually now can process this huge amounts of data and the fact that we have the data to actually process. So those are the two big leaps that have kind of enabled it. And now with image recognition enabling self-driving cars, there's a huge push from the industry to make this real. So. We've, John mentioned the winters, the AI winters, those were really, there was not a lot of way to commercialize it, but now there's a huge push to commercialize it. There's a lot of uh, successes, uh, as, I, as I mentioned, the AI applications that are already here. Okay, okay. 
So these are some of the devices that that the, the, the processing is working on. Initially, we started with just general purpose CPUs. And what this means is that when you have two cores, I can do two multiplications at a time. I might be able to do this really fast, but in order for me to solve that previous case where I'm actually doing all these multiplications just to generate one input, that slows me down. So what, uh, as John mentioned, we moved to GPUs that have many little cores that can do many multiplications at the same time in parallel. So that was the first speed up, and most of the AI is now in this realm. A lot of the self-driving cars are now using GPU devices. These are the same devices that you see in your Xbox, and your kids' um, video cards that they play in, and so on. So these are the GPUs that we use. The next step was FPGAs. This is what is used in data center uh, cloud now, and like Microsoft and Intel and stuff. Can you explain the acronyms? Because I don't know what FPGA means. Yeah, yeah, so that's a great point. So this is a central processing unit. Uh, GPU is the uh, graphics processing units. And then you have FPGA is a field programmable gate array. And what that means is effectively that you can take a device and program it to do anything specifically. So it's a bunch of disparate gates that you can program to actually execute a logical function. Uh, so this was the natural trend. And now the big jump is ASICs. So what ASICs is, as I mentioned, is these application-specific circuits. So these are very flexible, but they're not efficient at doing, what, uh, doing AI, for example. This gives you an order of efficiency and performance improvement. So you will see Google and other companies already investing and in putting money behind hardware to actually build these, uh, build these chips, which gives them, gives them much lower power and much better performance. So they can do more learning, more training, more complex tasks to, go, to, to basically uh, do learning, basically, and improve uh, the complexity of the problems they can solve. Uh, and this is really where in Vermont, the, the, the Avera Semi group is really focusing on AI. We basically build those devices for, for companies like Google. Um, the, the, um, the growth of AI is absolutely huge. So if you look at, we're expecting a 30 to 40% increase in the, the, the business that we get uh, for these devices. Um, and here I've kind of labeled the CPU, GPUs, and you can see the ASICs where we're working on, that's a huge growth, about 30 to 40% CAGR. Um, and by 2030, the expected worldwide GDP that's added is about $16 trillion. So this is really the wealth that will be generated across the world using AI. And the question now is, how is that distributed? Right. So there's a lot of potential, there's a lot of growth, um, but there's a lot of also societal impacts that, uh, that need to be really, that need your help effectively. Um, so on this slide, I just wanted to do kind of like a human versus AI system comparison. Um, so human brain is about 100 billion neurons. So those little balls that I had on the, on the picture, they're effectively 100 billion of them. And each neuron fires about 200 times a second. So that's the communication between those neurons. Uh, the wires, the connected neurons, are called axons in the human brain. And those uh, transmit signal at about 100 meters per second. Um, and our brain size limitation is really our skull. How much can you fit in there um, to, to actually do this processing? So the human brain has lots of tricks that we still don't understand. It, it really is a powerful machine. To do what it does within such a limited amount of power, it's amazing. AI systems are about 30 <laughs> billion transistors per chip. So, and that is just per chip. You can actually put many of those chips together to build systems that are the size of buildings and so on. And they're growing in what's called a Moore's Law, which is really the doubling of the number of transistors every year. Now, that is slowing down, but there's new mechanisms that are kind of extending, extending the growth of devices. Uh, these transistors uh, switch at about 10 billion times a second versus 200 times a second. So you have a lot more compute power. The electrical interconnect is running at the speed of light. Uh, and then you can build a computer size that can be any building. So if you look at the trajectory of AI, um, x-axis being time, y-axis being intelligence, and you look at a mouse, where a mouse intelligence is, 
then you see Stephen Hawking and the village idiot, they're very close together. We're not really, we're not really on the whole spectrum of intelligence. We're not really making a huge leap between that. Um, and if you look at AI, there's nothing really to stop it. It's a lot of It will just blow past this. So I think legislation is really needed to really, before we get there. Can I ask a, a yeah. question about that? So probably as a, 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 a imagine a Type 5 car now. Yeah. Uh, we're at the fully automated car. Uh, what percentage of that car in cost comes from this? Uh, is this an expense, a, a big part of the expense, a small part of the expense? I know that's a very competitive business in which expense is a very big issue. <laughs> yeah, no, so, so I was just talking to um, Volkswagen and they're looking at how they address their next generation devices. Yeah. And they're actually saying that 70% of their cars are eventually going to be electric, electrical devices cost. Like, so these are all electrical components, not just the brain portion, but the wiring, the sensors that you what did you say, 70%? 70% of 70%. the cost of the car. So yeah. the whole, the thing we think of as the car, uh, the brakes, the steering, yeah. and all of that sort of stuff, is only 30%. And yeah. this is the... That's the... Okay. <laughs> so it's not just the, this, this would be the brain of it, but you also have the batteries, for example. If you look at Tesla, for example, oh, sure. it's really a battery, an end, a motor, and a brain to it, right? There's not a... It's a very simple device from, from that aspect, right? And, and is this... Uh, is VW or anybody thinking that when you get to automated cars, they're going to be more expensive than uh, what, what would a car be today or less expensive? It would be less expensive. Yeah, significantly less expensive eventually. Right now, the biggest cost is the batteries. And there's a lot of focus on getting that. And that technology is improved. Yeah. Marching just like this. Yeah, <laughs> it is. Some of that. It's moving slower than the artificial intelligence world. Yeah. The batteries, it's moving much slower, but there's a lot of focus on it right now. About to sense some of like the lidar, for example, is really eighty grand is what I heard. Now. So, so what's happening with the automotive, the, the autonomous cars is currently there is technology that allows autonomous driving, but it's so expensive. It's like eighty thousand dollars to enable it. So they're saying that the way they will unroll it would be first you would have what they call robo taxis, where you have like a car that's utilized hundred percent of the time be fully autonomous because you don't have to pay the driver and you would be able to shuttle people around. And then you would slowly move to personal cars if they, they, uh, they uh, as the technology starts to get cheaper and cheaper to enable that. Can I ask one more quick question before you move past this slide? Yeah. You said before these questions, you were pointing and you said, legislation is needed before we get past a certain point. Before we get to here, right? Because why? The way I look at it is, well, if you look at how we treat less intelligent individuals in, 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 our, in our world right now, right? and if you look at even animals and stuff like that, right? I don't know if at that point it's too late to actually align on the control of AI. It's kind of too late for your dog to actually figure out whether you're gonna do something nice or not nice to it. Right? So are you concerned that artificial intelligence might threaten human rights? Absolutely. I mean, long term, I am concerned about that. I think, I think before we get here, I think we have a lot of concerns here as well. But I think eventually that is something that, that might be a, something that we need to think about for sure. Thanks. That's, yeah. So having said that, I think the, the, the possibility for good is just amazing, right? The, as I mentioned, $60 trillion of wealth generated. And you can argue that's, you can take care of everybody in the world in, in, in really amazing standard of living. Uh, you can, I've kind of tried to summarize this here. I mean, if you look at AI, you can consider thousands of parameters, petabytes of data, and make decisions, intelligent decisions. Humans can actually entertain maybe seven thoughts, plus or minus two, at the same time. So it's really powerful. You can really solve problems like self-driving cars. I think it's a 1.3 million people die because of human error across the world, basically, not in Vermont, but across the world. Uh, cancer detection is already here. We have uh, apparently apps that you can, that doctors use to take a picture of a, of a mole. It will tell you with the same accuracy as the best dermatologist whether that's cancerous or not. 
So we could actually do that. We use it for, uh, I think, uh, IBM Watson Health, I think, uses it for cancer detection, recommendations of treatments, and so on. Um, and, and I mean, all kinds of other diseases that we are too, um, that we cannot take all this information to make decisions could be, could be actually solved with, uh, with these systems. Um, you can remove dangerous working conditions, you can eliminate drudgery uh, from our lives, and really, if you look at the, the benefits of it, it could be tremendous, yeah, for, the, for society. Uh, the risk page has a little more small font, so. Uh, <laughs> privacy is a big one. Everybody is concerned about that. Um, so you have uh, security cameras that are really detecting suspicious behavior, suspicious behavior even without any human interaction. So you have a camera that's uh, monitoring, a, uh, for example, a, a parking lot. And it's not somebody watching the video feed of that camera that determines whether something is weird. Uh, if the camera figures out that there's an individual moving in a, in a suspicious uh, uh, pattern, it will alert the authorities and single out that. So you have now fewer and fewer individuals monitoring more and more cameras. So now you're kind of focusing the power uh, into fewer and fewer people. Uh, there's examples of racial bias in image recognition, uh, depending what pictures we've shown. Um, there's examples of AI that will amplify really our primal behavior and bias. So we had uh, Microsoft deployed a, a chatbot called Tay that became uh, racist uh, uh, very quickly on the web based on the, the people that it was interacting with. So it was learning from the interactions and kind of echoing that. And then the impact on democracy, uh, it's really we're focusing power in fewer and fewer hands. Um, in the past, you supervise that, you get the direction, and the employees can actually make a decision whether they want to follow that direction or not, uh, if they disagree with it. Um, it was inefficient, imperfect, but you did have some type of a group intelligence as a safeguard. Um, in the future, supervisor gives directions, you have an employee that's could be an AI robot or something like that. Um, it would be executed without any questions. It's very efficient, exact, but there's really no safeguards from the human perspective to actually do that. So you need legislation to make sure that when this is, is there, you, you really have enough checkpoints and balances to, to do that. AI arms race is a big, big challenge. Um, I think. Uh, between South Korea and North Korea, there's a deployment of what they're called sentinels, which are machines that, are, that could turn on into a mode that's fully automated and actually can make a decision whether they take human life or not uh, without, any, uh, without any human interaction. Currently, the, mode, the switch is on uh, human control, but they can easily uh, enable that. Wait, what kind of, what can do that? They can do that now? They can do that now, yeah. So in the, the, the border between South Korea and North Korea, there's, uh, there's uh, robots that are effectively uh, cameras with, with weapons on them. Um, they, are, they have, they have uh, the ability to be set in a fully autonomous mode. So when they see a human crossing the border or an army crossing the border, they can open fire automatically. That is not currently the setting of them. The setting is on, on, uh, on human guided, but um, the capability of building such machines is, is really not something that's too difficult when you think about it. Now we have a, a drone that you can fly and can follow you while you ski and take pictures of you. Uh, just connect the, the picture thing to a weapon and you have drones that can do things that we might not want to do. And then inequality is something that's highlighted by a lot of these, a lot of these AI things. We have, um, without AI registration here, you would have level of inequality that's that's tremendous. You have uh, people that can replace uh, most of their employees with robots, and um, although there's there could be wealth generated, the question is how that wealth is distributed. Um, yeah, so that's a, that's, a, that's a big concern. Um, in the next couple of slides, I kind of showed what jobs are kind of the most of, the most to be affected. So this is a, this is a snapshot from a TED talk that I that I was watching preparing for this uh, for this meeting. Um, so they were kind of showing uh, uh, the two axes here. One axis is really creativity. 
the other one, the axis is compassion. So really how much compassion is involved in the job. Um, so this portion here where there's uh, not a lot of compassion and a lot of not a lot of creativity, those jobs are really at risk first uh, with this type of deployment. Um, you then have uh, jobs that, are, that, that really need a lot of compassion. So those are jobs that would probably be uh, the most AI uh, robust, in other words. Uh, you might need AI to help you with certain tasks, but they would still need a human touch. Uh, creativity is still uh, something that would probably uh, remain uh, a human thing for, 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 uh, for a while. Uh, and then you have uh, the other side, something that requires creativity but doesn't really require a lot of compassion. That would also uh, be affected. So this was the... So this was the... So this was the, the really the, the breakdown. So these jobs will be fully replaced. And, and for example, everybody's talking about, the, I, I heard a lot of discussions about the self-driving cars and stuff, but I don't know if we're looking at the impact of millions of people being without jobs once uh, truck drivers, taxi drivers are all basically uh, covered with uh, self-driving cars. And you not only worry about that, but you also worry about um, all the all the enablement associated with truck drivers, like truck stops and uh, anything else that's really uh, built around them. So that's that's really at risk as well. Um, and then, as you see, the different levels of coverage is depending on the type of jobs. Question on that though: All these machines, whether they're autonomous or not, need people to take care of them. Like you need somebody to maintain it. Yep. So won't those jobs just turn into the maintenance of those things instead of the actual operation of them? Yeah, no, so there's definitely some level of maintenance, I agree, but it's gonna be definitely less than all the people that are doing the work right now that will be affected by it. And you can also have machines do maintenance for machines as well, but I agree with you. It, it, I agree, the, the jobs could migrate, but there's gonna be a lot of jobs that, uh, that, um, that would not. Right. Who, who, what's the professional background of the person who created the, these charts? I, I put together these charts, but these are actually, you can see the, the reference here. So you're, you decided that a CEO needs more creativity and compassion than a social I did not. These are the TED Talk. Yeah. yeah, so what's the background of that person? Yeah, yeah. What, did you, what is their He was a CEO. Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> For the record, let it be known. <laughs> I totally people. agree. Okay. I totally agree. There's that might help. That helps. Until we have it's artificial true. intelligence assigned the chart, yeah. then we yeah. like, we'll always have a good If it had been designed by a politician, the politician would be. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. It should be over here. This is uh, an interesting perspective for somebody in this business, uh, which was uh, this can do great things. But don't get, let me get too good because I'm going to, we're all going to hell in a handbasket <laughs> in the end. I mean, there's kind of a fatalistic ending to this. It's not fatalistic. I mean, I, I'm saying that you could have tremendous wealth. If you direct AI in the right direction and we have legislation to, to keep it in that direction, like I said, $16 trillion in GDP, nobody will have to work. Everybody would just go play golf and enjoy their life, right? <laughs> if you direct it in the right direction. If you direct it and you're misaligned with, with AI where it's directed, if you don't have the, the zero conditions, the ground zero conditions, that's where you actually could end up in a bad uh, position. So I, I think this is great that we have a task force talking about this early enough, yeah. Uh, these are, are uh, questions that only an AI computer in the end are going to be able to, to deal with because they're so large and global. I mean, uh, I understand the level of risk. I understand what the outcomes might be. What I don't understand is how you direct them yeah. Uh, yeah. to the right answer and not to the end. Uh, yeah, yeah. And we were talking about this a little bit uh, in the uh, in the earlier one about climate change. Our problem doesn't seem to be the ability to be predictive about climate now. We've got more and more data. It's going. Analysis is getting better and better and better and better. It's the policy question. Absolutely. People who have to then say, "All right, now that I know this, we have to do this." 
that is the big weakness, and it's the big weakness here. It is. And, and this one moves at an exponential rate. Yeah. So and, the, the policy would need to start yeah. following that rate, which I don't know if it's possible, but. And it's hard to know what to legislate. You know, when you say you need to have legislation, like legislation for what? I think legislation needs, as, as I think it was pointed out, I think education would be really key. It would be key for the, for, it would be key for a government to have very educated people in AI to actually be able to recommend the right, the right legislature for it. And it would be important to, um, um, in my opinion, it would be important to actually uh, continue to talk about this to, as we, as more developments happen, to be constantly changing the direction so we can actually um, end up with a positive outcome. The slide that I had with lots of wealth and lots of positive outcome rather than the negative uh, associated with it. Um, so this, this was another uh, thing I stole from a TED talk. They said, we had technologies that we came up with in the past. We had fire and cars. We can learn from our mistakes on these. You burn yourself, you didn't do it again. You got seat belts and restraints and airbags. You, you like reduced the, the number of deaths. I think we're on this side where really we need to get it right the first time. I think we need to align well to, to actually um, to make sure we don't make mistakes. Um, this is an interesting website. I think it's a lot of great thinkers in this space. Um, this is their mission statement. It's an interesting read if anybody wants to spend some more time on it. I think that's all I had. <laughs> Any questions? <laughs> Would you be available uh, for follow-up questions if we emailed you? Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Okay. I have a question, it's sort of broader than this witness, but it's related. To, I just thought about that. Um, we've had people doing like presentations, like PowerPoints and stuff. Is it possible that we can have that? You know, collect those from witnesses and have them posted on the web so that the general public can refer to them. I see Kayla nodding. Okay, cool. So is it okay with you? If, if yeah, yeah, okay. yeah, absolutely. So we're going to have Slack. Okay, great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Thanks. Thank you. Appreciate it. Next is Tim. No, no slides for me. I'm Tim Kenny. I'm the uh, CEO right now of AI Certain, which is a small startup company that I started uh, with my son Nate two years ago uh, to do some work in AI. I'll tell you about it in a minute. But in many ways, I'm going to be the counterpoint to what you just heard. So uh, let me just go from that standpoint. I'm going to roll way back to me coming out of St. Mike's College in 1986 when AI was hot. Um, and it was so hot that I wanted to go study it in grad school. And I finally got into, there were like five really good programs in the US. I got into UW-Madison, and I studied artificial intelligence vision there. And uh, I got my master's degree, and I was excited, and I left. And I got a job at the AI lab working for a big CAD camp company, computer-aided design, computer -aided manufacturing. And we built a super cool piece of AI to get rid of draftsmen. Back then, you would, you would get ready to make a part, and there was a step where a guy got paid to label the parts so they could be put into a machine by another job, the, a guy that would set up the machine, and it would stamp out these parts. And it was a big part of the industry. And we worked for two years on that piece of AI. We came out with it, it sold for three months, and then it got shut down. And the reason it did was they came up with a way to get rid of the next job, too, by just automating the whole plan right into the machine. So both of those jobs disappeared and our AI left and uh, our whole unit got shut down and I went off to IDX next. Um, and then I did AI and IDX too. So what did I do there? Well, I worked in the support, I, well, I was a software developer running a team, but we worked with the support group because the calls were coming in from the customers and the business was growing so fast. We said, can we automate this and make these calls so that, that the people taking the calls can find the answer faster? So we built what back then was considered AI. Today, you know what you call it? You call it as simple as the Google search engine. But it was AI back then. So we used all this machine learning, and we built some really cool stuff. And uh, did we take jobs out of the system? Probably future hires that we took out of the system. 
um, that never got hired to do the research on each individual problem because they could look it up, find it, and get to the customer very quickly. So um, we did that. Then I went on to work for medical record systems there, uh, and we, we started to work in doing medical record systems. All of this using machine learning at times, but AI had cooled off. I think you heard about the AI winter. It wasn't called AI anymore. We called it object-oriented programming and um, support vector machines. And it was all these algorithms, these tricks of algorithms. And we would use these, and we would build them into the systems. Well, GE bought IDX. Uh, and uh, I became global vice president of uh, R&D for imaging. So I had 12 offices around the globe, um, and I would go visit these guys. And we had two groups in Europe that had some really <coughs> cool AI and vision that did, um, for uh, radiology, cancer detection in, in lung and uh, breast imaging. And it was great. And statistically, it was better than any doctor. Well, we installed that at, uh, I better not say that name that client. We installed it at a clinic, and they used it for um, a period of time, and then they, and it was better than them, we were tracking it, and they shut it off. And the reason they did was they were worried about liability issues when the doctor disagreed with the AI. And their reputation's on the line, and there were also false positives from the AI, and they hated that, because then they had to explain why they disagreed with the AI. So that sort of faded away, that was in the 2000s, um, and then, uh, obviously, the rest of everything that was going on, we just considered IT, but there's, there's machine learning built into so many things that we're using today. There, there's no fear in the AI that's out there for me of any of it. I will say, I, I don't really want to walk by an armed robot at the front desk that, that, has, that has bullets in it that's ready to shoot me if it decides I'm a threat. I'd like a person to make that decision. And I think we're a long way from that kind of uh, that, that kind of ability. Now, getting to the tech talk on, on the hardware, the hardware has enabled me to do something that I never could have done even 10 years ago at GE because the tech didn't exist, which was we came up with a way to combine what we call n-dimensional data uh, to come up with um, predictions. And what that means to us is think of it as an MRI image the radiology images, this is how an actual radiologist diagnoses. They don't just look at an image, they look at your medical record, they look at the other lab tests, they look at the images. And we came up with an AI, we're waiting to see if we can get a patent. And it's very hard to get software patents these days, so I give us less than 50-50 odds that that money will have been well spent with a patent attorney. Um, but we wanted to be able to predict those type of things. And in that process, my son, happened to say he's more into sports than I am. He's like, hey, Dad, couldn't we feed this sports data and use the same n-dimensional thing to predict sports? And I was like, yeah, um, well, let's do an experiment. Let's find where we can buy the cheapest sports data. And uh, it's funny because I'm, I'm not a gambler by nature because I can do math, so I don't usually like to lose my money. Um, and uh, uh, we came up with the horse racing industry. So. We happened to call the Kentucky Derby uh, Exacta pick as the best pick in it, and it won. People asked me, well, how much did you make? It paid $63 to one. And I said, well, it was a minimum $2 bet. I made $120. <laughs> um, so, uh, but uh, we're, we're in the process of trying to license that tech out right now into that industry. Um, how good is it? Well, we're 10% more accurate than the best experts. And why? Well, because, like you heard, um, the software that we developed can analyze 1,500 data elements per course, per race, and look through their entire history to say, how's it going to run today? And any normal uh, person who sits at the track all the time and looks at the things and goes and looks at the horses, they can get an instinct for it and they can get very good, but they can't do that kind of analysis at that end. But it's an algorithmic trick. And you can't pick up what we did we heard about the labeling piece. You can't pick this up now and just go, hey, don't worry about the NFL. Let's, let's do fantasy football next. It's actually a lot of work because you've got to label everything for it and set it up in the right way. It's not general purpose like you can learn it on its own. So when I think about, I happen to disagree with the predictions of a singularity coming in the next 50 years. I think we're hundreds and hundreds of years away from it. And I would be excited to say, 
that uh, none of us have to work again and that type of thing. But the automation is going to happen with or without um, the legislation because that's always what's happened. So when you go into McDonald's today, and uh, I happen to uh, take my uh, ill brother who loves to go to McDonald's, so I took him to McDonald's, and uh, the front counter's gone now and you order on the devices. Um, so they've just automated those jobs. Some of the front counter jobs are gone. Well, can AI cook fries better than the fry person? You bet it can. Never gets tired, never gets, and it can always pull it out at exactly the right time, see if it's crisp enough, put it back down if it's not. Um, it, it can, and we're not going to be able to stop this. And it won't, my personal opinion is, in four or five years, to say the next AI winter is coming. And you won't call it AI anymore, you'll just call it software. And you'll say, can the software run the, the fry machine? And the answer is yes. And can the software drive the car better? And the answer is probably statistically better. Um, there will be situations where, I, I heard the transportation talk, that was excellent, um, where you say, and I think you gave the example of the airplane crashing. Those things are going to happen. They're going to be catastrophic. And the question is, do they happen less? And the answer will be probably much less. Um, but it'll be making a decision, and do we really want a machine making that decision? And that's the hard thing we have to decide. But I worry, and the reason I said yes to this is, um, I, I think I, I hear some great things about education and some things we need to do, but I worry about Vermont and our tech industry here looking silly if we pass something that looks silly um, to the rest of the United States we are going to lose jobs. It's already hard to recruit here. It's hard for me to find the people that I needed. I was also a president and CTO of My World Grocery while we grew, before we sold it to a private equity group. Uh, we used AI there too, by the way. I saw 60 million transactions every night come in on the system for groceries, and I can guarantee you that I knew what you were gonna put on your list better than you did before you went into the store. And we actually built that for one chain, Creep the customers out so they had to turn it off. So it would say, here's what you're going to buy next time you're at the store, and they, it didn't go well. I would so, like that. <laughs> yes, well, instead we turned it on to the advertising side, so we know when to sell uh, the rights to push ketchup um, to the ketchup people. So we could say, do well, you want to buy it this one? Uh, but I want us, as, as uh, I, I would like you guys, as your committee or your team that you're looking at, to be extremely cautious about setting a tone about being negative to what I consider software and automation because it, it will knock us down. We worked very hard, a number of us in this community over the last 30, 40 years or longer for some people, um, to build Vermont's tech image and Global Foundries as a result of that. Companies like Dealer, uh, IDXGE, um, my Web Grocer, uh, those things take a long time to get the right people here and to do the recruiting. And if we start passing legislation that looks like we're afraid um, and it's not wise, um, then we're going to have some real problems. And I think that's the main thing now you came to just give another standpoint and opinion on it. And just to be clear, I totally agree with you. I think we need more education, more, <coughs> more people that are capable of doing AI so we get, but we also need a direction to make sure that everything is moving so everybody benefits from it. I, I'm totally not negative on AI. I think it's a great technology, and I think it's just like any other technology has the power to be both used for good and evil. But we just want to make sure that it's used for good and we enable it. Uh, from the positive side, are there things that we could recommend that would improve the climate? You're worried about us recommend things that will make the climate less attractive. Now I'm sort of on the other side. Are there things that we could recommend that would the climate for AI development in Vermont? I, I, I'm going to address it a, a little bit more from the software side and, and a little bit less from AI, but um, education is certainly number one. So let me tell you about um, at MyWeb Grocer, uh, we had 300 software engineers working for us in uh, Romania in one location. They graduate in that city in Romania, more software developers than all of the colleges in New England and New York State combined. One city, and it's because they don't have any other main industries. So if you're super smart, you go to school for software. And these people are excellent. Like, and, and I will 
tell anybody. Like now, we wanted to keep the core of our technology in our control, and we didn't want to set up a complete shop there, so we kept a lot of engineers here too. Um, but that education piece of helping people get that high-end education in software development, which or today we might call it data science, or um, it's, it's not really AI yet, but maybe, maybe it will be someday. Um, I think that's important. But the second thing is access to money for startup companies is still a major problem in Vermont. And it's why you see these companies start up in Massachusetts. So we aren't at the stage where we're out looking for capital yet. But if I do, my expectation is I will have to set up the headquarters in Boston in order to get the funding we're looking at to go into other areas. That I can't find it here. Um, and we found that even as my old grocer at the stage where we took in venture money um, that the Tarrant brothers did, um, you, that, that was a Boston-based company. And the only reason they were willing to do it was the company was so far along, they wouldn't have touched it in its early stage because they don't want to make the trip up. So we need to find a way to free up more capital for startup companies too. I, I agree. I think we need to bring more AI startups in the companies in, in Vermont. Um, I think that would be a benefit to Vermont tremendously, especially as jobs transition from one set of jobs to others. Yeah. So I'd like to have this conversation. I think Romania has the fastest internet service in the world, or just about. That's another gigantic problem yes. for us. I agree. Yeah. The remote areas, and I look at that many times. My my wife likes to look at Zillow too much. I'm like, no, no, <laughs> it's not fast enough internet connection. I have a question for you. So you mentioned like concerns about um, this task force recommending legislation that might make Vermont look silly or that might hurt econo the economy. Um, are our missions broader than just recommending legislation? And and we've been asked to look at how to. Um, how Vermont could be a place that would promote development of ethical AI and how AI could be used to improve the efficiency of government and to improve our economy and also whether or not a commission should be established to, for ongoing sort of work. Um, so it's not just like within a year we're expected to propose laws or regulations or not. That's one of the, the things. So having put that out there, I'm curious what do you think about um, an ongoing commission to look at those things? Or do you think like the government should just stay out of it and trust corporations? I, I, I think it falls into the individual areas of government for, like the transportation one was an excellent example of the people who oversee transportation saying, are, are the cars safe enough to drive themselves? Um, but to look at AI as its own thing, to me, um, I don't know how you do that. Like, there's AI in your washing machine when you use the smart wash cycle. There really actually is. Um, it's machine learning, that's how they train. Um, I, I don't know how you say is it ethical or not on, it, as, you, as you get into software and you say it's showing you an ad, is it ethical to show you an ad to buy ketchup right now? I don't know how we do something like that. When you were concerned about having a robot being the checkpoint, right? Yes. Um, has, has, has it, it does, and, and to me, that there, there are ethical components to those type of things, and I, I, but I don't see it as AI as much as it's an, it's an armed device. Um, I, I think we get scared because we say it's artificial intelligence, but it's not general purpose AI. It's, it's very trained and detailed in one area as specific. <laughs> And to me, it's about the safety of a device, not not the technology underneath the hood to call it AI or not AI. Yeah, I agree. I mean, AI could be just a, an optimized software program. That, that, that's how you can look at it, right? Something that's optimized. The, the only difference is that nobody has coded it. It's the machines that actually broke the code effectively. So the, the testing is definitely there. But I think the, the, I think the government would benefit probably from looking at the technology direction where we're headed and kind of look ahead and try to see how to meet the problems that might be arising. For example, like self-driving cars, taking people out of the job, so driving trucks and so on. So I think that would be the benefit of actually 
having experts like us maybe present more of the technology we think the technology is going. One other thing I just want to throw out there to think about, I hear your point about how it could be handled in all the different silos of government, but one of the things we hear about, one of the problems of government, is that historically, we humans, for whatever reason, it's probably, one could say, it's the way our brains are designed and the cognitive bias that we have. We break things into categories so that we can understand them, but in that process of separating things, we have created problems for ourselves, and that, I guess, like the, the question I would have, or, and it's not for you necessarily, it's for our group and for our society, is do we need to be thinking um, more interdisciplinary, and do we need to be thinking about the intersection? And it, this, you know, artificial intelligence um, could be viewed as a tool that has the capability on its own of exceeding its maker. And if that tool, if that kind of tool is happening across disciplines and we're not communicating between those silos, does that undermine our efforts? You know, to, this goes back to your presentation, you know, around, of, of what, so I just want to throw it out there. It's a question, and, I, and I've heard sort of people present from both sides for the last two years. So I hear your point too, but it's, my question is, you know, can we trust that if we break things into pieces that we're going to be able to stay ahead of it? And I don't, I, don't, I don't know the answer. I don't know if you've had the answer if anyone does yet, you know? I think you need to look at this as a powerful technology, and you need to figure out how to best control it uh, to some extent. But it is a powerful technology. And controlling it might mean actually like bringing a lot of AI to Vermont uh, to actually educate people about it, to actually have, um, to, to, to reap the, the, the financial benefits of it, but also have some type of uh, better educated legislature to actually address it to whatever challenges come. Alright, thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thanks. Up next is Joey Appleton. You're right on schedule. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, right on schedule. Right on schedule. Really? We're not really on schedule. Oh, oh we're all missing all a few things, Joey. Oh, sorry. I'm not going to take any time. I'm going to leave it even a lower notch than we were at. We can all rest this year at the robots. Joey Appleton is my name. I work with Engineers Construction, ECI. There's We've got hundreds of vehicles on the road uh, throughout the state of Vermont, so everyone's probably seen them. Um, we do, do a lot of the civil infrastructure that, that we all drive on every day. Um, and we work on building projects. We're building a playground at the Montpelier Elementary School right now as we speak. Um, so we get involved in a lot of different projects all throughout the state of Vermont. Um, a lot of the things that we do, um, we rely on people for pretty much everything. We have equipment that can move things, but we right now we rely on people to stop those with their very dumb tools that require very uh, well-trained people. And so one of the problems we do have right now is getting well-trained people in the door. Um, it's one of the things that we do struggle with, and the whole industry is struggling with, especially in the state of Vermont. Um, my background is civil engineering. Um, I worked in Boston with high-rises in Boston. Uh, I went to the Gulf. I built uh, a lot of projects in, in the Middle East and seen some of the projects that are, are you know, individual projects that are larger than what the whole entire state of Vermont spends in construction a year. Um, so I've seen things across the board of different magnitudes of uh, work and different technologies most of the time. Um, one, of the, one of some of the things that we are actively doing right now in construction um, at ECI or in general that is actually you know, considered artificial intelligence and, and I, in general I consider artificial intelligence any, anything where we're relying on a computer to make a decision, and it's not a, just a linear path of going from point A to point B. Um, so right now, for example, a lot of the things that the biggest area of, of AI practice right now is in the machine control equipment uh, that can control itself, that can drive itself. Uh, right now, it's you know, we have on our in our program right now we have several pieces of equipment that has an operator sitting at the seat, but it's got a computer that guides it, that tells it how how to dig the ground, it tells it bulldozer how you know what, how to lower and raise the blade so it can sculpt the, the, the roadway exactly to what the, the model tells it to do. Uh, and, that, and that's all GPS control and that's pretty um, you know, that's as advanced right now as 
uh, I said people getting in, in the state of Vermont. Um, Japan and some of the other um, Asian markets are a little bit more advanced where they actually have guys controlling pieces of equipment uh, remotely from other workstations from other countries. Uh, big, bigger projects, bigger, larger mining operations and things of that nature where you have you know, tremendous amounts of very large, very um, expensive equipment. That's where you kind of see more of the, uh, the overall automation and the overall um, you know, lesser human impact on, on the minute by minute operations. So, um, so construction, in, in general, construction is about 10 years behind the, the manufacturing industries on technology in general. Um, and then the state of Vermont, I would say, based on my experience, is probably another 10 years behind some of the other states and some of the other um, countries in the world as far as technology goes in the construction sector. Um, but some of the biggest opportunities that we do have, you know, we're, we're, we're widely recognized to be you know, most of our jobs are over budget and, 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 and over time, and so we're not the most efficient industry uh, for many different reasons. We've never seen the same building twice, at least most of them. We've never seen the same job site twice. We always build one of a kind of things for the most part uh, compared to the manufacturing. <coughs> so that's a big reason for that. Um, but um, some of the biggest opportunities that we, you know, that, that are out there right now are related to, you know, uh, um, software systems that can, um, optimize schedules that can understand all the different widgets that go into a project and then build a schedule that no human can possibly build and, and identify the steps. So, so there's ways that we can we can you know, streamline construction for sure um, by introducing a, um, fewer people on the ground it makes the job site safer. So there's certainly a lot of safety aspects to it um, that can be that can be seen and found. Um, we, um, there's there's you know, Every day, we're making dozens and hundreds and thousands of different decisions on um, how to deal with the situation. So there's definitely plenty of room for, for computer-guided um, decision making, um, for scheduling, for sequencing of work, for material procurement, and then even in the design and the engineering phases. You know, there there are you know the, one of the first things we do when we get a project is. is the drawing set, for example, we look at it and we try to understand the scope of the work. And it doesn't take us very long to, to ask questions and say, why are we doing it this way? Why is it being done this way? Why did, why did the designer, you know, maybe Brian draw it like that? Um, and we do. Um, so I think there's a lot of area for artificial intelligence to be applied into helping, like someone like, like the Agency of Transportation, for example, to decide what to what projects need to be put out there next. What the scope of that should be? Should that should we replace that railroad bridge, or should we rehab that railroad bridge? And you know, there's, there's millions of different decisions that can be made, um, and I certainly think that will help us overall be a little bit more efficient as a as a uh, as a sector of the, of the economy. At the same time, the more efficient we are, the less waste we have. You know, some of that that's, that shift is happening somewhere. Someone else's labors, the labor staff are getting paid less because they're working fewer hours because the jobs are getting done quicker or, you know, however. But, um, so there's, there's lots of opportunities uh, in that respect. Um, as far as autonomous vehicles go, you know, we've got, you got dump trucks driving down the road, you got uh, the equipment being hauled back and forth. So there's certainly, um, you know, that technology is certainly something that will tremendously impact the construction industry. Um, it's scary to think that you have a dump truck loaded with, with Stone driving down the highway next to you with nobody running it. So there's certainly no, so that all the legislation and all the all the effort to go into keeping the, the transportation industry safe with respect to, to that is certainly something that would um, need to be considered and need to be at the construction site as well. Um, definitely, the state of Vermont. Uh, we work all over the state, and there's more, more often than not, we're in an area that has zero connectivity. I get in trouble all the time. I, I don't, I've only been in the state of Vermont for two years now. <laughs> I'll map myself to the job to go look at the job, but then once I get there, I don't realize I probably should have been paying a little closer attention because I got no surface now, and I can't map myself back, and I end up now navigating through some of the back roads, which get me lost. <laughs> So I think def definitely, you know, some of the things that we should be doing in the state of Vermont will definitely be expanding our network. Um, and that's that's a that's a to, to if we want if we want AI and we want big big data collection and big data use, um, connectivity would be a huge huge 
interesting that we need to invest in. Um, at the same time, you know, myself and the I actually moved to, I actually bought a camp in Vermont, Northeast Kingdom, several years back, and I bought it because it was in the middle of nowhere. My cell phone didn't work. I had nobody calling me, and it was nice. So at the same time, you know, that's for me to Vermont. Um, but so I'm going to get into way to weigh those balances, I guess. Um, you know, the agency of transportation is definitely the, 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 the biggest spender in the infrastructure sector in the state as far as a single agency or single entity. Um, so they, you know, collecting, starting to get data collected, um, starting to actually build up our databases of information. We're a very slow industry at, at that, so I know there's some big, um, big pushes right now at the AOT to um, expand their um, automated um, systems and data collection systems for managing and administering construction projects. So that's huge. Um, that's definitely something that should, should keep up. And then my company in general, um, we're in a transformation right now. I'm, I'm filling out paper time cards at the end of each week to go to an automated cloud-based data collection system. So little things like that. We can't do anything without the big data sets. So um, definitely need to, as an industry, and start collecting more data that's actually available to be used. If we don't, if we can't access that data set, then we can't do anything with it. So I think that'll be a good thing. We want to encourage technology producers to um, actually you know, invest in the new, new data sets uh, to use to actually build these. Um, education is going to be huge. You know, right now, right now, we're you know. Right now, we joke at our office, we'll, we'll take anyone who's got a pulse right now for a job. It's, we, are, we are in the need of, of people still. So, so the fact is, it's going to be very many years down the road where we're not going to be very, very, very reliant on people in this industry. So I don't see 25, 45 years from now, I don't see us. Maybe we're going to be, maybe we'll have a few jobs shifted. Maybe we'll have, you know, maybe 5 to 10% fewer jobs. With the machinery and software taking over here, but I don't see any big jump, any big one beyond that. Um, I think we've got a long way to go even before we even start to make projects for this one. So, yeah, so as far as legislation goes and as far as you know, contributing to, to, to this growing uh, industry, uh, connectivity, education, you know, we've got to educate people to get them back into the industry in general to actually care about the construction industry and actually. Um, Contribute to it. So right now, it's a, in many respects, it's a kind of a dying trade. So getting people back into the trades and getting people educated on the software side and the technology side to actually help put their uh, their effort back into it. Um, yeah. uh, does anyone have any questions? So it almost sounds like you almost need to invest in artificial intelligence due to the lack of labor force. Right now, I would say yes. I would say unless we get more people coming in the door um, that are looking for jobs in this uh, in this industry, it's not. It is, it's, it's, if you have no if you have no training, no education, no formal education, it's not a very pleasant uh, working environment. It's cold. But yesterday was below zero for the guys out there. It's not ideal. Some people love it, some people love it. So in the short term, it sounds like you need you need more workers, but as technology progresses, you will inevitably need less workers. Yes. So that's something like we need to think about. It's like we might want to encourage people in the short term, but it's but in the long term, if we put too much energy into pushing people into construction, they're gonna be out of a job in 20 years. Years, so we have to think about the balance. I think it'll definitely be a huge shift. Um, there'll be there'll definitely be a big shift before we start you know, needing fewer people. I think that's probably something that <coughs> is, is inevitable, but um, probably forecastable. But it's not be definitely getting more people into the trades, getting more people with with technology backgrounds into the trades. Um, they, they don't, everyone doesn't have to come in and be a laborer or equipment operator. We do need more people who show who have an interest in, and it's a very complicated. Um, it's a, even though any, we'll, even though we'll take anybody with a pulse to come and join us, it is a very complicated and complex industry. It's not like manufacturing. 
everything is everything is is, is, is different it's in a different location. There are different constraints. Uh, there's different environmental conditions. So, um, for those reasons, it's definitely going to be very slow at adapting um, the technology compared to other systems. But the more we can, the more we can um, you know, take the, the 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 lessons learned from the manufacturing industry and apply them to the construction industry is huge, and it's going to get people to actually the effort and the time into, into making those connections. And then and not being on board equally with the designers and with the architects and everybody who's got to see everything. You know, every, every, a lot of uh, there's a big you know, not my backyard type mentality a lot of times where people want to see <laughs> people don't want to go look at ugly bridges, right? And so they want to look at a bridge that blends in with the environment. And when you get the environment is different, every square, you know, every square foot of your of your image, then it's you know, it's, it's tough to uh, introduce Manufacturing type practices that, that do mass production and mass replication. I, I do have one more question. It's a simple one. You've said more than once that you're looking for help. If, if people in the general public who are watching us or watch this recording are looking for a job, how could they get in contact with your company? Uh, website. Um, can you say it again just so that yes. there might be people that watch you? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, engineers construction, you know, we're at, you know, uh, Google, Google us on uh, ECIVT.com. Thank you. I have one, one quick question. Uh, yeah, go, go for it. Um, this is on behalf of some young people I know. You mentioned the uh, Montpelier uh, Elementary School playground. You also said that a lot of projects come in over budget and over schedule. I just wanted to know on the record. Is that project <laughs> 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 on budget, most importantly on schedule? That budget will come. That project will come in on schedule. That's and great. Here, we will come in under on budget. <laughs> That's wonderful. I, I'm, I've been being told the budget is it's being raised as as more donations and more contributors. Great. Thanks very much. <laughs> I, I, I imagine because of your lack of labor force and you're continuously you need people, you're turning down work, right? Uh, it's, it's, jobs. It's, we are we are um, being having to be more creative on how to how to staff jobs. We're having to be more creative on how to optimize where the people where we, where we send people and, uh, and weigh the risks of, of one client getting upset because we left their job to work on another one. So another area for AI to help us better so, manage our resources. So are you being more efficient and is software scheduling and sequencing helping you? Yes, and right now you know, we are introducing software as we speak. Um, we're in the implementation stage right now in order to reduce the amount of time we're spending doing some daily record keeping. Reduce the amount of time it takes um, our payroll department to process the uh, you know, paychecks for our 150, 175 employees uh, each week, those types of things. So the more time we can get people to free up, the more productive we can be in the field, the more we can do with what we have. More or less, more or less. What is optimum employment in your company? Um, optimum employment? Yeah. It's a very, it's a very um, fluctuating industry, um, especially in Vermont, especially in the COVID season. So I mean, right now, our revenue has peaked at 200, mm -hmm. approximately. Uh, we will drop down to 100 or less even during the winter months when things slow down. So right now, I mean, we're, we are in a a growing state, though we are we are looking to expand. There are market sectors that are drastically under equipped, um, or there's, there's a lack of um, talent and expertise for certain sectors, especially in Vermont, especially in some of the more environmental sides of things. So that's a different area that we are looking to expand on, offer offer new and competitive services. Okay, so my name is Jill Sharma, as I mentioned before, I'm president of Vermont AFL-CIO. I am a retired letter carrier, which means I spent 31 years outdoors working, and I'm here to, to like to tell about it, <laughs> but I'm not going to. Um, and you know, this is, it's like Charles Dickens, it's the best of times, it's the worst of times, you know. AI offers us great opportunity, but we are going to have to set a standard of living for it. Here we are, the richest nation on the planet. We need to set a standard of living for people as AI moves forward. And right now, and 
many people in this room that know a lot more about this than I do, but I look at it like uh, AI is kind of having hiccups and burps. And, but boy, when this stuff unrolls, it's going to go fast, and we are going to be faced with some incredible decisions that we should be making now. And so essentially, I uh, kind of scanned some information from the uh, Transportation Trades Department of the AFL-CIO, and they respond to uh, legislation in Congress. And they make remarks uh, along the lines of, uh, <coughs> they were firmly believes that the existing regulatory regime is inadequate for these vehicles, talking about automated vehicles, self-driving vehicles, one, two, three, four, five. Uh, when Congress passed the National Traffic and Motor Vehicle Safety Act 19, of 1966, the law vested the National NHTSA with the responsibility for protecting the public against accidents created by improper design, construction, or performance of motor vehicles. For automated vehicles, NHTSA's voluntary, unenforceable guidelines do not uphold the agency's founding mission of ensuring safety and protecting the public. By allowing manufacturers to deviate from or otherwise ignore the guidelines, this approach may create a dangerous patchwork of patchwork regime of noncompliance. These are the kind of things that is attracting the eye of labor. Um, then they want to be they want to be in the mix. So when they develop committees like these at the national level, they want to have a voice in how this unrolls and what happens to displaced workers. Uh, 2008 to 2010, they did a little examination of workforce, and they found that uh, workers were now in 17 percent less. And so when we say, oh, we have full employment, a lot of people are working for less, so their standard of living is going down, and that is no way to drive the economy, no way to build the economy. We are very interested in when these jobs are being displaced, that we have proper training, and for proper training for a person like me who's technologically inept, that they have an ability to have a meaningful job, and also the geographic locations, you know. And one industry may shut down and look at the auto plants all over Michigan, and what happens to those communities? So how do you keep building a community when the industry leaves, and how do you these are all questions that need to be answered, and we should be prepared to answer them and have solutions. And you know, we envision a work day that's shorter. We envision more flexibility, more time for people and their families. And right now, we are at an odd place where people are working more. Like you know, there's no workers because we're automation is at a point where it still needs a lot of workers, but we're going to go past that. And when we get past that, how do we do it? And we're not doing a great job right now where we underpay people and people work for three, possibly even four different companies are never home to raise their families, so on and so forth. So it's, it's time to take a good look and hopefully our legislature will focus on some of these issues and not just on the, you know, like with the displaced with the NAFTA trade. The amount of money that workers who are displaced were eligible for was like this big and their loss was like this big. We need to do a better job of ensuring the standard of living for the global community and certainly for the richest nation on earth because we, are, we create pockets of third world poverty in this country. So that's the short and long of what I wanted to say and keep us on time. Is there a specific model? So what I'm just going to get back to that. So we've talked about the um, Let's say that 50 percent of people who are now drivers trucks. It's like 170,000. Yeah, it's a lot of people. So yeah. let's say 50 percent of them lose their job. You know, that's a huge thing uh, in terms, and obviously it's more so in some places than others, and but it's affecting. Um, what is the, is there an example of a kind of program um, that has worked with displaced workers that would be an effective substitute? Um, uh, I get that training for is part of it, but it, again, if you're in an overall reduction of workers in the economy, uh, training is only going to be part of it. 
part of the answer. Um, uh, uh, you, you don't want to say, I would think, that all these people can go out of formal welfare. That's not particularly what you're looking for. No. Uh, so what, what is an example of a kind of program that could uh, meet this need and has effectively impact? So I think what I can tell you is what I think of when you ask this question to me is sitting in the legislature and listening to people talk about the need of 10,000 workers in Vermont a year, okay? And we spend, I don't know, we spend a lot of our budget on schools and we work really hard and our kids do a good job in school, okay? But still, we haven't met that training need for what we need for today in the state of Vermont. So I can't say that there's a magic bullet, silver bullet, or anything of that nature, but we have to be more thoughtful. And it's something that we need to do as we, you know, this problem of not having workers in Vermont, it, it didn't just happen today. But we have to address it and we have to keep up with it. And how we do that, you know, in Vermont in particular, you look at the technological uh, people that we don't have, but we have an aging population. And this population is gonna need some of those people from the TED Talk to help take care of them. So we really have to start gearing ourselves in two directions, one in the nurturing field and one in the technological field. So how do we do that? You know, do we, well, Romania apparently has an idea of how you get this job done, but they have better internet than we do because they invested in it. Too. So how, how do we invest? Where do we invest? How do we do, we do now? And so I don't know the answer, no, but I know that we are a thoughtful state and we will work on it and hopefully we will do something better than what we have done. I think the curriculum is like a really key piece in my opinion. I mean, to some extent, you want to take a big chunk of that $16 trillion worldwide and put it in Vermont, ideally. So the curriculum to train the, the people to actually take a piece of that is, is a huge thing. I think you can start as early as high school. I mean, we describe very complex principles, but it, it really isn't that complex to actually use. Um, so that is set up. Training is part of it. It, 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 it. You said one of the long-term visions here could be that we just have less work. People have more time. Uh, there are fewer workers needed in the economy. And how do we then deal with the So we have a shorter work day, OK? So the, the, the question becomes really, as you transition towards that period, you're going to go through, yeah, drivers losing potentially their livelihood. Um, uh, and, but you will also see a lot of people still be able to work in the creative fields, in the compassionate fields, in a lot of these fields where you need the human touch. Uh, but at the same time, you also have uh, people that do creative things that need help. And that will be where a lot of the training for AI would help. Uh, you would shift jobs in those positions away from the positions that really don't need as much creativity and also don't need as much compassion. So those, maybe you can target those groups and start training them to move into a direction where um, they will be ultimately needed. Um, but eventually, ideally, if, if, if we get to the point where you have all this income that's coming in and you don't have people needing to work um, then things like basic universal income come to mind. And I, I know a lot of countries are throwing that around uh, to figure that component as well. Um, yeah, that sounds starts to get, not a judgment, but it just sounds like socialism in a way, right? It's like somehow we're, well, we're, we're generating that, all this stuff. Because revenue. we can't picture that because we need to spend billions of dollars in yeah. infrastructure, okay? And, and we need roads that we don't have. And there's just so much work that needs to be done today, it's hard to picture it. Yeah, I know, but still it's generating all this all this revenue. I get that. And it's going to all be robotic. And somebody's still going to own those companies that's generating all that revenue. And then it gets redistributed to, to all Rest well, of do us, you have so we don't have to work. I mean, it sounds wonderful. Yeah. What do you mean with the industrial revolution? How many times does that have to happen for us to yeah. catch up? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That sounds great. Pull the trigger on that until people yeah. Yeah. But, lose their jobs. But yeah. at that point, what do you do with those people if they don't have income? And I no, I understand. So I was thinking just in the short term, or practically speaking, it's we've had at AC a transportation a hard time finding people that can drive plows. And we used to have two people in each plow truck down to one and it's just it's really difficult it's like they're not at least they're not hired farmers right they would come up you know they would they, and they had those basic skills and it's hard to find people now 
and it's hard to find people just to drive trucks, period. We've heard that. We heard last last time it's hard to find people who want to farm. And so, I mean, I'm kind of wondering if that's more of an opportunity than a, a, you know, a risk at the moment, which is people don't want to do those jobs. And the technology is kind of coming in the back over time. And, and so, um, so why why push people in that direction? And, and so it's less than a, it's less of a retraining thing because we don't have enough people in those jobs anyway right now. So it's not like we need to retrain people right now to do something different. It's more about how do we train the workforce in the future. Right? Well, if we have four thousand people, we need ten thousand workers a year in Vermont. We have four thousand people each year who fall off the rolls. Okay. They need a job, a purpose, a reason to get up and go to work and feel productive like they got something at the end of their day, I would say. So we, the situation already exists and we need to address it and find a way to get people to out there to work so they feel like there was a point for them to go to work. Well, was that, is, that a, is that the result of automation and AI or is that just the I, mean, I, I think there's always I, problems I, I, that. It's something to do with the education system, okay? Always I would say that's I, my I guess I'm trying to say, take. is there really going to be more of a need for retraining because of this? Or there's a need for training yeah, right now. Forget retraining. There's a need for training. Are we going to have another opportunity to explore this topic more in depth? Because there was a few things you both have said that I'd like to get into and we don't have time, which are like one of them. I'm not going to get into it, but yeah. I'm just going to state those things. Yeah. One was this idea, I heard you say something about socialism and redistributing yeah. wealth. And like, yeah, I would ask the question, is it fair that we have a society set up that's allowing certain people to develop systems to extract wealth on the backs of others and accumulate that wealth we always have. Well, had okay, that. Right, let me just finish my question. Did you both just have a picture of time? So, <laughs> is it fair? This is a question for the group to think about as part of the AI discussion. I think. Is it fair that we continue to allow systems to exist and let AI enhance that? Is it fair that we have AI that's being used to exploit and extract and accumulate wealth without a plan for humanity and the earth after? That's a question. It's not, I don't expect us to get into it. The other question is, are we going to look at a universal basic income? I am not advocating for it. I'm asking about it because it's something that comes up often. And there have been people who's, who've asked me if this group is going to look at that. And I'm, I said, you know, we're looking at AI very broadly. And that's a whole other thing that's separate from AI. But is it going to come up? Then? And so those are two things from your sort of both you two going back and forth that was coming up in my head. Yeah. Well, I think that that is who knows when that's coming. That I guess my point is, it's hard to picture right now when we have all this work that needs to be done, whether it's training people or fixing roads, whatever, it's hard to picture it. But when AI gets its wings, it's going to fly, and it's going to happen fast. And that's what I would say to you. So do we have, can we have, maybe this transitions to the last part of the day, because we're going to talk about, uh, on our agenda, we're going to talk about future topics and kind of break up tasks. Right. So maybe we could just go, I'll stop and ask at that point, can we look at some of these these things more? Because I feel like we just opened something that. The idea I understood was that in these earlier uh, meetings, we were going through the areas of application. And uh, by doing that, we would draw out these general issues that cross all of the lines and are ones. And this is one of those things. And that we would use the rest of our time uh, having, had, we'll have a few more meetings after that to start doing exactly what you're talking about. And I agree, this is one we, we need to talk about. Okay. That's my perception. Sure. We need to talk about it, but as a person who spent their life in the environmental, the health care, and the education systems, for those three things, I'm a socialist, but I live in a country that's market-driven know that we're going to be able to solve the fact that we live in a country that's market driven. We're going to worry about what we can do in Vermont to maybe decide to be a role model for what can work given the system we're stuck in. Not stuck in, I mean, it's, it's, it's a way of <laughs> being very it's how we are. <laughs> yeah, we may, not that we're not going to change the rest of the country. <laughs> we, may not, we may not solve much of anything. 
but I think that one of the biggest things we are we will do is bring to the light issues, and, and that might spark national and international discussion or feed into that. So. There, there was actually I noticed in the first book I read, I put that in, there was a lot of international work going on this subject. There's not a lot of U.S. work that I can say. That's insane. That's a lot of international work going on. I think we started this by saying, I think we can steal ideas from various <laughs> areas where they have kind of work in our for now. Okay, if we move on. Okay. Um, have well, we actually approved these minutes? Um, yeah, yeah we, can, no, we can do it now. Uh, we'll do that right after this. Uh, I see he's putting his stuff away, so you better. Do you got to <laughs> <seven>. <laughs> John, John's still on? I doubt it. We have four, more. Five, six, seven. We have seven. Yeah. Can yeah. you stick around for a little bit? Yeah, I just was okay. coming closer. I'm sick, so I've been hiding from you all. <laughs> I think it's a little more important um, than the approval of the minutes. Um, one thing back in, I think it was October, the October meeting, um, we decided to talk about all these issues, we talked to all these speakers about industry, in these industries. Um, certain industries we have not allocated for future meetings, and I wanted to discuss if we should and if we should. Uh, we should probably select the industries, the subcommittee chair, and members. One issue, one proof that come to mind without looking are criminal justice. It's on the list. We, we, we just organized the first three of them, and there's, I think, two or three of them left. I went, while you were talking, I went back to the minutes on exactly that point, and I understand that we agreed to five areas. Uh, Ag and natural resources, the number one we did. Transportation, technology, and manufacturing, today's. Uh, social education, criminal justice, medical health insurance, services, retail, and food. So I'm now taking that from the minutes that Caleb uh, did of the October 12th. Uh, so we've got, if we stay on that schedule, we've got one more of the three, that is the medical health insurance one to do, and then we're going to do two others, and we just need to get together the committees for that. And I look, because I would like to do work on the criminal justice, and I volunteer. So Gene and I have been working on doing the health, um, health insurance and medical, so we plan. And you're next time. Yeah, we plan for that, so we're good with that. I would like to participate in that, too. And there's two more after that. So we have we have like five to seven people we've been reaching out to. I don't know if we've got a confirmed list, but we're doing that work and we're adding to that. So it means Joe just all you have to do is call Gene. He's kind of coordinating it and talk with him and then brainstorm with him. But we will end up by our next meeting with some witnesses. And we may not get everything we want, we're trying. Mm -hmm. There's some really good witnesses popping up though. Good. So it's happening. I heard you're motioning for yourself to be the subcommittee chair for criminal justice. I know. Okay. I think that's what I heard. <laughs> I heard the motion. <laughs> Discussion. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, uh, okay. Uh, accept you. <laughs> well, it occurred before I could say no. Um, all right. Yes. So uh, we need. Does anybody else interested in? I would join that subcommittee. Yeah. Uh, we need the social. Your, your, you seem to be. On most of these subcommittees, and this no, is no, I too so far. But I didn't do much on theirs because I didn't really have expertise. Um, I, I'd like to help you. I may not join your meetings, but I have some ideas. I talk with the judiciary, and maybe we could just talk outside of this meeting about what I've heard. And, okay. Right. Yeah. And um, the education side. Who's, uh, who's... I'm looking at the like a student, <laughs> or the student in the room. <laughs> Well, why, why you have, you're having a call. <laughs> I am interested in being a part of that, but um, probably none of the chair. I, I can't. No, no, I, this is not now that. recruiting other people. I accepted um, the. Oh, I thought it was people who aren't here, right? That's how it works. <laughs> yeah. That's the very best way to do it. Yeah. Uh, okay, well, well, we'll we'll get that. And and uh, we're talk we haven't set a meeting yet for uh, the next two times, the next two, right? We have February, February, March. We have one for January. Yeah, we have January, and that's it. So this would be February. We want to try to do that now. Yeah, because if yeah. we start recruiting people, we need to know on recruiting day, right? You're finding that, and that's 
what happened with the rescheduling, actually. But uh, yeah. you know, clearly you can do it. Yeah, I would definitely suggest we pick the February and March dates now, even if we don't know the exact topics for March. Maybe February could be criminal justice since we have an eager volunteer. You know, and <laughs> how many people are we seeing for all today? Seven. I think there's eight, 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 eight right now. One, two, three. There's a six missing. Okay. Uh, one one was John. It was John. Gene phone. Trey. Oh, John was here. That's right. Yeah, no. PCCD. Yeah, my. So. Yes. We're sticking to Fridays. Is still generally the best Friday for you? It's just for simplicity and it seems to work the best or no? Is that our next one? Is it? Uh, yes. Yeah, so Friday. It's, yeah, it's a Friday in January is the next one. Next term. Uh, and when is now? Uh, I don't have it. The next one's Friday the 18th, 18th of January. So about a month from the east. <coughs> so I'm looking up when it's on the If we start with Fridays for the February meeting, it would be either the 15th or 22nd. I think I would rather do the 22nd. I would support that. Is that OK? I think I, I'll, I think that's you know. Now, you know, legislators in session, people are going strong. The idea of Friday afternoon was that that would hopefully be more. Fun. Okay, 20 seconds. Now, that would, be, that, that would that be criminal justice? Mm -hmm. Yes, it would be criminal justice, uh, social services, and uh, education. That's the three, as I understand it. Um, now, the last one I think was last, less form. That is services, retail, and food. Now, I don't remember what goes in that. Of course, we did agriculture, so I'm not sure what this is. Uh, I think it's that McDonald's story we heard earlier. <laughs> yeah. So this might be, a, this, this services, retail, and food might be a place for us to talk a little bit more about the labor issues that yeah. we were just starting to touch upon. Yeah. Um, what, are, we, are we thinking March? Is that what you were yeah, that was the idea. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Okay, I don't mind serving on this committee, but I am not driving to Montpelier to sit in a room with a telephone again. Okay? <laughs> Just saying. What, we had a little subcommittee about uh, getting the word out about these meetings, and I drove myself to Montpelier to sit in a room with a telephone while everybody else called in. So I, oh, uh, I get that one, too. I live in Middlebury, so oh, I don't want to do that. You don't have to. We don't have to have meetings, though, because yeah. there's actually what came out of me and John and Donna's effort mm -hmm. was that it's way more efficient if the chair just calls people individually, okay. and that's what Gene's been doing. He's been. We haven't had one subcommittee meeting for healthcare. We just he just calls people. Well, I was on that committee, so I haven't been called yet. So. Because I did sign up for well, that. Well, maybe, maybe you can check with Gene about that. Yeah. You, you, and that you can, I would actually suggest you do because I don't think he's intentionally leaving you out. No, I'm just saying that, that so, you don't, that because you don't put the word out, it, it doesn't get to everybody. Is my guess. That's my so I, I guess what I'm saying is I would yeah. recommend that instead of us having subcommittee meetings and doing that huge process, maybe it could just be the chair because we're just talking about lining up witnesses, not making huge decisions. So maybe well, the no, chair. Well, yeah, none of us actually is. Yeah. <laughs> All I did was ask people uh -huh. to attend the last yeah. one. Yeah. Yeah. We had friends. And yeah, we were interested. I, yeah. We never physically met mm -hmm. in a room and we did everything we did. Yeah. yeah. Back to scheduling. Yeah. We had the February 22nd for criminal justice. Would it make sense to do Friday, March 22nd or 29th for the following one. I like the 22nd because it's spring. We can have a spring celebration. Well, when's crossover? Crossover is the week before town meeting day. So that's like two or three weeks after the crossover. Um, and we had talked about after town meeting day doing more um, stuff around in those final months, doing some more stuff out in the community. Um, but I do think, not to get distracted, I think we should do a March 22nd meeting. And maybe in February, can we put it on our agenda to talk about what we're going to do in March and April for outreach? Is that fair? Uh, yeah. yeah. And uh, we, I don't know if we can get a committee. Do you want to get the March committee together or do you want to do that next time? You mean like pick the topic? Well, the topic is, was the sign that services retail. Oh, OK, 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 my bad. Right. I didn't know what you mean. In a way, retail is the number one money issue in AI, I would say, uh, in the sense that uh, all that stuff we get and all those advertising and all that kind of stuff is all generated out of us assuming you put it together data and then manipulating it to try to, to, to get our, uh, I add the word, worst impulses. 
uh, to determine our spending. Uh, so, in a way, retail is actually a very big AI issue, I think. Uh, and I also think it's where you'll see the uh, workers be, be fewer workers. Oh, sure. That's, so that's, that, that's, that's, really, part, of, that's yeah. part of the issue, too. Yeah, yeah. And we could talk about exact, more directly talk about that. It comes up uh, because it's not been a uh, a specific subject, it comes up on the margins so far, but we could do we could do it in the retail one. Uh, so should we put off forming that committee just for another meeting? Could there maybe be more people or different <coughs> number here? It sounds uh, like there's a lack of interest. We, we, we're good for we're, we're good for the next one and the February panel yeah, justice. Right, I think yeah. we can wait on that. So we'll have to do it at the next one. That's, that seems fine. I mean, I'm interested in the next one. I just, someone made a comment how I've been on every subcommittee, and so I'm trying to step back. Uh, yeah, yeah, but I'm happy to help more, and if, for what it's worth, maybe instead of being on a subcommittee, what if I just ask around in the community, like, what do you think we should be, who should we hear from, so whoever is the subcommittee, we might have some ideas where they can start, because I didn't see anyone jumping up, like, I know exactly who to bring in, you know? Like, I have no clue who to bring in for that. For, for, the, for services, I know I'm going to ask about it, education too, but I don't. Yeah, for the answer. education one, actually, the find for me, I find that to be the hardest to figure to out. To find to people. Like, yeah, well, I mean, I got, a, I got a thought about it. So, so, so we're not going to do the March one. That's the only reason I didn't volunteer for the I think that's yeah. holding the date is good. But I, so I'm just thinking about, so we had 10 meetings, and so we're talking about January, February, March, so three, this is our four, so that's seven meetings. And then the last three will have to be much more direct at getting solutions and much more public engagement. I, you know, it seems like, I don't know what much more public engagement means if it's, you know, one meeting or... Well, I think we need to put these things out, put press releases out, let the public know health care is a hot topic, okay? And when there's a meeting about health care, I think you could probably fill the well in the state house. Um, but you got to get the word out. I mean, seven days wants to know what we're up to. I don't see them here. Uh, one way we could do it, uh, I've said this before, is that if we, should, if we announce by the part of Digger that is announces that we're going to reach meeting, yeah. so what is about you know, all that, I think we would get So I did project. communicate to the Agency of Commerce and Community Development. And they said they don't do press releases, so I, I didn't, I, I can put a press release out from the Vermont AFL CIO, and I'm willing to do that, but I didn't want to do that without talking about it first here. And we had had a, we had had, I don't know who else was in it with you and I on the phone. We did Milo have and John. that one meeting you yeah. were referring to, and we talked about some ideas. At our last meeting here, you were absent. Yeah. And all I said was we were going to try to bring the public access in. Yeah. But I, perhaps there's a value to us reconvening between meetings and coming back to the next meeting like with very clear things we're going to do to increase that. So I guess I would ask, does this group, is it okay with this group if I put a press release out about our next meeting January 18th? Sure. Okay. <laughs> okay, thank you. And Milo, what did you hear about? If you think there's going to be, just, uh, if you think there's going to be people coming, then I mean, this the space at least there's a little extra room. Yeah, yeah, yeah it's, it's better, better than the one upstairs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I think healthcare is something uh, Well, all I would ask is that is that I mean maybe this is asking too much, but I would ask because it is on behalf of the whole group. If you send it to us like the BCC, so we're not breaking public meeting law, or use the slap and let us like give you some feedback before it goes out. Um, and also that we make sure people know that there's only going to be a 10 minute public comment because it's common with healthcare where people start coming and like arguing for universal health care every chance they can get, which I support just for the record. Okay. But I don't think it, this is the space to have 100 people come and try to like say that publicly when that's not what we're actually talking about. The other thing is the side <laughs> that we are authorizing you to do this as the subcommittee chair on. Yes. Public well, then I wouldn't put it out on the AFL-CIO. Yes, because it looks like it's an emergency. Okay. Uh, so then that, I, yeah, I, yeah. So I, need if you put it in Slack list. and then you call yourself something, whatever, that would be great. Kayla? So um, 
they seem to prioritize picking the top of the living room. Would you guys prefer to um, be here? I, I think we should meet here if we want to invite the public, because otherwise we're setting people up for I don't know how others feel. I mean, I like that. Yeah. It's much more glamorous, but... Yeah. Um, There's more space here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Where am I supposed to go for it? <laughs> yeah. 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 So, glamorous. Yeah. 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 Maybe on the... Is everything settled here? Maybe the last, yeah. the last, the last item, a little real quickly. We'll look at the meetings from uh, last meeting. Does everyone have a copy? Uh, uh, yes. Uh,